Sure. Okay, good, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Did you get coffee and bagels and all kinds of good things if you're here in Carbondale? Um, my name is Dr. Deborah Barnett. I am the Associate Director of the SIU Research Park here. So welcome. If you have never been here to our facilities, we welcome you and uh, we're happy to give some tours after the workshop today if you would like. I also serve as the Director of Business Incubator Programs, uh, which in this building right here in Dunn, Richmond, uh, we house our Business Incubator where we have startup companies and others who are in some of those other companies who are in the early stages or uh, might be growing and expanding. So uh, we're happy to have you all here. So again, just welcome and thank you for joining us today to learn more about small business innovation research funding. The SBIR funding program uh, encourages small businesses and entrepreneurs to engage in research and development that has potential for innovation and commercialization. So just a few things uh, before we get started here in Carbondale, we'll also be broadcasting today's workshop via webinar to hosted satellite locations throughout the state of Illinois. This collaborative effort was organized by the Illinois University Incubator Network. We have Sherry Soliday here in the back in the pink. Good morning, Sherry. Uh, Sherry's been instrumental in helping us to coordinate and, and get this workshop going and as well as the satellite locations. Uh, the Illinois Small Business Development Network, the Illinois PTAC at Western Illinois University, and Teresa uh, Ebler is here in the back as well, and she is um, helping with our host sites throughout the state, uh, making sure all of them are able to hear us and they're able to speak and ask some questions um, when that time comes. So thank you, Teresa. And of course, the Southern Illinois University Research Park. So we would like to welcome and introduce our host locations today. Uh, joining us today are the Joseph Center PTAC in Forest Park, Illinois, the Illinois Small Business Development Center for the Metro East at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville, the Western Illinois University SBDC in Macomb, Illinois, and the Women's Business Development Center PTAC in Chicago, Illinois. So we have folks joining us from all throughout the state. And as I said, uh, about a dozen individuals who are also joining us. So we also want to uh, welcome them, those who are watching uh, as individuals, either from their home or their office. Okay, okay. So I'm going to is the president and lead consultant for Garden Consulting Services and the GrantHelpers.com. He has over three decades of experience with grant development, government contracting, program and project management, training and documentation, and program administration. Garden has written and advised on scores of SBIR proposals for several million dollars to nine of the 11 federal SBIR granting agencies. He is an SBIR workshop leader and national i participant and has managed several projects resulting from, from resulting in successful SBIR proposals. In addition, he has set up bookkeeping and timekeeping systems for many SBIR recipients, very important, uh, invoices and incurred cost proposals and has helped navigate multiple com companies through federal audits, many of them conducted by the best contract audit agency. So we are so uh, thankful to have Roland here with us today. I think you'll find today to be very helpful. You're going to learn a lot. I know I will learn a lot as well. And so please help me welcome Roland Gardner. while they're coming up. A lot of good organization goes into this, so we want to recognize that. Four remote sites, all the local sites, everything is happening and everything so far is running smoothly. That's a hefty piece of work, so good work on that score. A word about the workshop. Uh, this is, think of it more of as a workshop than as a presentation. I get bored hearing myself speak, so I'm hoping that you'll chime in and ask questions as we go along. For the remote people, I will have 
pauses in the presentation where I often, or where I stop for questions, but during the course of the presentation, during the course of the workshop, feel free to enter into the chat button and we've got chat monitors and they will raise their uh, hands and ask, answer, uh, ask questions and I will respond to those. So feel free to chime in uh, as we go along remotely or locally. Federal government has a lot of money that it allocates for research and development. In fact, in 2017, it was $118 billion. Back in the 1970s, some very intelligent lawmakers thought, you know, we're spending a lot of money on research and development, but there's, there's a resource that we're not tapping. Young graduate students, young entrepreneurs who are fresh and aware of the state of the art and enthusiastic and energetic and not burdened down by huge labs, that's a huge innovative resource that we have in the company. Wouldn't it be nice if we took some of this money for our federal research goals and set it aside for small businesses so that we could apply the dynamic pressure of small business entrepreneurship to our national research goals? So they thought, yeah, let's, let's do that. Let's skim a little bit off. And, you know, if, if we do that, not only will we be able to meet these federal research goals in ways that we couldn't before, but we'll also stimulate innovation in general because we'll be funding dollars to support some of the most innovative engines that we have in the country. And well, if we do it right, we should be able to set this up so that every research dollar that goes to a small business also helps them succeed as a business because we'll, we'll stipulate that any of this small business money also be for work that's commercializable that they can turn around and sell. And if they turn around and sell it, they will become strong tax paying companies. And that's the financial goal. These are the main pillars of the pillars of the whole program. Meeting federal research goals to spur small business development so they become effective commercial entities. You know, they thought we could also address a lot of societal benefits as well. We could make improvements to the environment. We could address some diseases that otherwise aren't being met. There are, we could uh, approach some underrepresented groups in ways that we haven't been able to approach before. So they, they thought through this in, in 1982. They said, this is a pretty good idea. And they were right. And upon these pillars then rest the Small Business Innovative Research Program, an excellent, strong public governmental program that is going to be around for a while. It was established in 1982, and the stricture was at that time and still is, any federal agency with over $100 million of research dollars, research budget, has to participate in the SBIR program. There are 11 of them. In 2012, it was reauthorized for five more years. It's now good through September of 2022. Anytime it nears being uh, reauthorization, always strong bipartisan support to continue. In fact, the percentage is getting larger all the time. This is a program that's an excellent program. It is not going away. A strong program is going to be around here for a while. Um, Illinois does pretty well with this program, by the way. Illinois gets around $50 million a year in SBIR proposals. In fact, here's uh, 20, 2016, we got $57 million. 2017, Illinois got $60 million. 2018, we got $51 million. 2018 was a down year. We were, Illinois is 12th in the country in terms of states getting SBIR awards. We're sixth in the state population wise though. There should be room to do a little better. And that's why we're here today. We want to increase the number of SBIR proposals and the number of dollars that go to SBIR here into the state of Illinois. So what benefits do we have for the small business? So it, it is very good for small businesses. You get all told with all the phases, and I'll talk about the phases in a minute, you know, a million and a half dollars, sometimes even more, in direct money to fund your research and development. There are awards, there are add-ons, there's commercialization approach, all kinds of extras as well. The money is completely non-diluted, another beautiful aspect of the program. The government doesn't want your IP. The government doesn't want a stake in the company. They don't want any equity. They will not ask for equity. 
you own the IP, you own the equity, it is a grant or a contract, you own everything afterwards. The government doesn't want it. You can go out and sell it. The government doesn't want this because they want to use the program to build strong companies. And if you own everything, you're a stronger company. And that's their financial justification. So that in the end, you have strong companies that pay taxes. You do get access to a lot of commercialization support. The SBIR program does not fund commercialization per se. The core of the program doesn't fund productizing, marketing, customer discovery. There are a lot of add-ons that do, but the core of the SBIR program doesn't uh, provide that commercialization. But if you have an SBIR award, you get access to a lot of help. So there is an added bonus there. And a lot of companies need investment money. And there's hardly a better way to demonstrate that you have a solid technology to investor than to say, we have an SBIR award. Because the investors know the federal government scrutinizes these awards very carefully. 15% of them might get selected. Something like that is the award ratio. Anybody who gets an SBI award has been vetted by some of the best and brightest leading state-of-the-art people in the country, has been deemed successful. So the SBI award is very attractive to investors. You can leverage this to get investment money. So what does the program actually fund? Primarily, technology, research, and development efforts. Most of the proposals are staff, people, to work on technology R&D. Staff time is the big. You can also get materials and supplies to fund your work. If you need to take travel, you can include that in the budget. Uh, if you need consultants, that often can help you know, the strength of your proposal. It'll fund that. Sub-awards, it'll fund that. Any other direct expenses related to the project, these are fundable within the SBIR program. And these are all direct expenses. So all these direct expenses are part of it. But the government also realizes, well, if you're running a company, you have a lot of expenses just in general for running the company. You have rent, you've got the time that you spend to run the company, phone bills, all these other expenses, indirect expenses. You can't allocate them to one particular project, but you can request indirect expenses on top of your direct expenses. So in your proposal, you have all these direct expenses directly related to the research. You can tack on a percentage of indirect expenses above and beyond that. And you can tack on above that profit, which typically is about 7%. So in a $225,000 award, which is the going rate for NIH and NSF, they're at the high end, you end up with about $120,000, $130,000 worth of staff time, typically. So about half or so, a little bit more, is what goes into direct by the time you add on the indirect expenses and the profit. Indirect expenses, profit, all have to fit into that total uh, ceiling, the total budget amount. But the grant still doesn't cover all of your business expenses. It doesn't fund basic research. The technology has to be far enough along that it's potentially commercializable. If you're doing research into the basic uh, cosmos of matter, what is matter made of, that probably isn't commercializable. SBIR program won't fund it. The SBIR program per se will not fund commercialization of customer discovery, the product development, going out, uh, exploring the marketplace, doing market analyses and reviews. That is not part of the direct SBIR program. As I mentioned, there are lots of add-ons for the program, the ICAR program and other technical and business assistance, but the SBIR program itself won't fund commercialization. It won't fund something that's not innovative enough. If it's just an incremental improvement to some existing technology, probably not interested. Innovative, keyword for the program. To be innovative, you've got to do something that hasn't been done before. You need to do something that's advancing the state of knowledge, that's advancing the science not just another application of existing technology. I often get people with a great idea for, for a new app. We want an app that will help uh, direct charity money to, for local people. No one's ever used an app this way before. Well, the technology to produce an app is already out there. So most every app that you develop, you're not really developing any new technology. You're just using the existing technology. That's not going to move the science forward, not going to move the state of the art forward. That's probably not fundable. So one of the keys to finding the ideal sweet spot in funding is to be far enough along the technology transfer chain to where you're beyond basic research, where you're commercializable, but you're not sure that it works yet. It 
has to have an area of risk. If it's innovative, it hasn't been done before. If it hasn't been done before, de facto, it has to have an area of risk. So if the government is looking for risk. Won't fund model, model, um, modest design improvements. Won't fund intellectual property protection. These are some of the things that you have to kick in as a business beyond what the program itself will fund. As I mentioned, there are 11 different agencies. The big five, Department of Defense is by far the biggest. National Institutes of Health, Department of Energy, National Aeronautic and Space Admission Administration, and the National Science Foundation. These are the big five. Even the NSF gets more money than all the others combined. And all the others are agriculture, environment, commerce, which includes NIST and NOAA, Homeland Security, Transportation, and the Department of Education. These tend to be smaller dollar figures. So what does the program actually look like in practice? This will be familiar to a lot of you who've heard about it. It's a three-phase program. It starts out with a solicitation. Each agency will issue some kind of a document. And that document might be called uh, RFA, Request for Application, an RFP, Request for Proposal. You get FOA, Funding Opportunity Announcement, all these different names of uh, documents. But the agency publishes a solicitation it says, we are now accepting proposals. And then in response to that, the small business concern responds with the proposal. We would like to develop such and such uh, technology for such and such a reason. Here's why we think it's gonna work. And if they're successful, they can get a phase one proposal. The phase one portion of the program has the whole intent of proving feasibility. Remember I said, it's gotta have an element of risk. It's gotta be risky. Well. You need to identify the key areas of risk. What is it about this that we're the most uncertain? What is it about this technology that we can isolate a few key factors that if we can prove that part of the technology works, we'll be confident that it's worth pursuing a little further. So phase one, feasibility, tends to be in the $100,000 range. The smaller funded agencies tend to be a little less. Uh, NIH and NSF are $225,000. They're the two biggest ones tends to be six months to 12 months long. NSF lets you choose how long between six and 12. USDA is eight months. Uh, Department of Defense is eight months or six months and then an additional four months. So it's a 10 month kind of effort. Each agency is different. And by the way, that's one theme that you'll hear throughout this. There are some SBR rules that apply to all agencies, but there aren't that many. Beyond that, each agency has a lot of choice in how it implements the program. So you get a lot of difference among agencies in how they implement it. Then the amount and the time frame is one. So if you're successful in phase one, and if you've proven your goals, and at the end of phase one, you write a final report, and you can apply for a phase two proposal. Phase two proposals tend to be on the $1 million range. Some a little less, some a little bit more, but around $1 million. Now, almost all two-year proposals. Phase two is where you really flesh out the technology, you develop it more thoroughly. You get to the point where it's ready to start commercializing, where it's ready to start packaging and selling to the public. In general, I mean, sometimes you can sell betas before then if you want, but that's uh, in general what phase, phase two does. The phase one uh, acceptance rate is about 15% nationally, so it's a very competitive proposal. And this number is going up, by the way. Um, the agencies are reporting, some of them, around 20% acceptance rates in phase one proposals. It's surprising it's going up. There's a little bit more money available in the last few years. And I think that the public is getting much wiser about what's worth funding and what isn't. So they're not getting as many low-grade proposals as they used to. Phase two, phase two proposals tend to be around 50%. If you've done your work in phase one, and uh, at the end of phase one, you've met your goals, chance of getting turned on for phase two is much higher. And we've got a question from the remotes. Yes, uh, so uh, Steve Bob has asked, why does only 50 per, excuse me, 50 percent of phase two get awarded? Is this because there are many theories that fail, or is it because there's just not enough funding? So far, all of the agencies wish they could fund more than they have the money to do. So it's a little bit of each. 
one, there's not enough money. They would like to fund more. But it's also, it's, it's competitive, and uh, some of the phase two proposals aren't that strong a proposal. Sometimes phase one, uh, you sort of meet the goals. I mean, it's research and development after all. You can't be sure you're going to meet them. And so at the end of phase one, well, we thought it could do X, Y, and Z. It can only do X and Y. We're going to submit anyway. And the government says no. So it's a little of both. Phase, yeah, thanks for the question. Phase three is not funded specifically by the SBIR program. Phase three is the end goal phase. That's where you're out selling product to the companies. You're not funded by the SBIR program, but that's the end goal. If you are a Department of Defense recipient for phases one and two, then you might in phase three sell to the Department of Defense. In fact, usually they use phase one and two to develop technologies that they eventually want to buy themselves. But in phase three, the Department of Defense buys it out of their operating budget. In phases one and two, they shuffle SBIR money into your work. In phase three, they can't apply SBIR money to it, but they've got their own budgets that they fund you off of. And that's what they want. There's a sister program to be aware of. Small Business Technology Transfer Program. Same program as SBIR. It's almost identical. All the rules, uh, the solicitation is always the same in SBIR slash STTR solicitation. The difference is with STTR, you are required to partner with a research institution. The research institution has to do at least 30% of the work. Um, beyond that, they're, they're really the same. If it's an SBR proposal, you can still partner with a research institution. They just can't do more. The business still has to do two thirds of the work in that case. There's a lot of times you have got a question, well, should we apply for an SBIR, STTR? And you get that in the university environment like you here at Southern Illinois. The faculty member is probably, his lab is, or her lab is probably gonna be used in the research so do I call this an STTR and make sure that the university amount is sufficient to meet the goals? Should I call it an SBIR and make sure that the university amount is less than enough so that it can apply to the SBIR goals? And it, it's always a call. You can't tell ahead of time which is, is best. And they're calling the program manager and talking to the program manager can help you quite a bit. If you talk to the program manager, they can usually advise whether an STTR or an SBIR proposal is the route to go but you can't tell ahead of time what it's going to be. The STTR program is mandated for all of those agencies that have over a billion dollars in funding. And those are the big five that we talked about before. They all participate in the STTR program. The smaller six have SBIRs only. You won't get an STTR option for education or agriculture. Any of the smaller ones. I mentioned the differences among agencies. Another difference among agency is the schedule. And here's what the different agencies sort of look like on a typical year. These aren't exact dates, but this is roughly the timeline that you see. NIH three times a year, Department of Defense three times a year. The smaller ones tend to be once a year. This to NOAA Commerce is once a year. Education once a year. Department of Energy, which is one of the biggest, one, bigger ones, twice a year. Department of Energy requires a letter of intent. You have to submit the letter of intent to them well ahead of time. And then if there's no problem with your letter of intent, they'll kind of grunt and say, okay, you can go ahead and submit. But you don't get any feedback from them. If it's really off the mark, they will tell you it's probably not a good idea to submit. But minimal feedback, it's mostly pro forma. The letter of intent is mostly for the Department of Energy to gauge how many proposals are gonna come in so they know how many reviewers to, to sign up. So they're not, it's not intended to get feedback. NSF just this year went to a rolling deadline. You can submit any time. Quite a change for them up until 2019, two dates a year, mid-June, mid-December. Scrupulous about it, five o'clock local time, 5.01, you will be rejected. 5.00.01, you will be rejected. One second after five o'clock, you will be rejected, no longer. Now you can do it any time. You have to submit a project pitch. You have to submit into their online interface about a three-page document, and they give you the format. There are several questions you have to answer. 
You answer the questions, you submit the project pitch online, roughly three pages, and then they get back to you within three weeks, and it's usually a lot faster than that, and they tell you whether you're allowed to go ahead and submit the phase one proposal. So they have a pre-proposal stage now, and unless you get invited, you can't do a phase one proposal. So that's the project pitch. Two different kinds of awards, grants and contracts. The granting agencies have very broad topics. These are general goals, and it's pretty easy to find something in these areas. USDA, NIH, uh, Department of Energy, National Science Foundation. Uh, here are some example goals that they have that you can respond to. Plant for USDA, plant and animal product protection, broad goal. They've got a topic area, conservation of natural resources, another rural and community development. They have an aquaculture section in the Department of Agriculture. So it's pretty easy to meet a federal research and development goal when they're defined that broadly. National Science Foundation has 22 topics, also very broad. Biological technologies, energy and power systems, information technologies, and it, as if you couldn't beat any of those, their 22nd topic is called other. So you could have other, even if you don't meet their already very broad topics. You remember from the first slide, you have to meet a federal research and development goal, but for the granting agencies, that's pretty easy to do. As long as you fit within these broad areas, any technological idea that you come up with, you can tell them, here's my great idea, and they will entertain it. The contracting agencies, by contrast, much stricter, much narrower, much tighter. Every time a solicitation comes out, you have to look at a long list of very narrowly defined topics in order to see if you meet one of those topics. And let me give you some example topics. If I can uh, read through these, let's see. Here's an example topic from the Navy. Picosecond high energy compact laser system for marine wave boundary layer atmospheric characterization instrument development. One of their topics. Here's one from the Army. Photovoltaic powered low power dehumidification systems for individual combat vehicle interiors. Very specific. You have to really know what you're doing. Um, in fact, some of these DOD topics are so narrowly defined, you know they have one company in mind. You know that when the time came to prepare the solicitation, some program office had a company in mind with the technology they wanted and said, well, we'll make this into a solicitation. And so the, the proposal is essentially a wired proposal. The topic is a wired contract. They've got somebody in mind. Nothing technically presents some, prevents somebody else from applying, but the chance of you being successful is kind of narrow. So when you read through solicitations, it's important to read through the level of specificity and see if they aren't a wired proposal. And mostly you detect that by the level of specificity. Uh, fortunately, the websites related to SBIR have a lot of good tools for searching through topics. The SBIR website has some tools. SBIR.gov, great website. You can go there and all kinds of resources, very rich. Well, the Department of Defense has a list of tools. In fact, on the research page at the end, I provide you the links to those. So when you get the slides, you can see. And just go right to those tools, type in your keywords, and it will help find solicitation topics that are appropriate for the technology that you have in mind. All right, let me pause now for questions, and then we'll talk a little bit about eligibility and competitive competitiveness, how you really position yourself to be a strong competitor in these proposals. But while I get a quick drink of water, any questions in the meantime? And now we'll go down to the business. Do you have any questions here in this room? Yes. Maureen. When you said that you could um, consult with your project manager, mm -hmm. who is that and how do you find that person? How do you identify that person? Yeah, uh, in the topic, in the solicitation, there'll be a list of topics. If they're broad topics, they'll be the broad ones. If they're narrow, they'll be narrow. But there's always a contact for that particular uh, topic. Okay. There'll be an SBIR contact. Okay. There's a little bit of an art 
to approaching the contacts, and I'll talk about that specifically in the next section when I talk about process. Direct, you know, interacting with the program managers is, is very important. You get excellent guidance from them if you can get through to them. With NSF, it's built into the program. If you submit your project pitch, and then they can respond to the project pitch, and then you know whoever responds to you is one of their program managers. But I've got some resources and some guides for that. Yeah. So if you have a CIR or department of is there a chance that what you end up creating as a result would be something that the military would be the only one that could purchase or classified or anything like that? Or is it guaranteed that you can commercialize whatever it comes out? Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Um, there's a strong chance that the government will want to buy it. In fact, that's the way DOD rolls. They usually use the SBIR program to fund the development of technology that they eventually want to procure themselves. The DOD over the last few years has become more interested in sponsoring programs and companies that sell to the broader public as well. The government retains a right to all IP that you use. They, they retain a right to use products developed with that IP. It's a non-exclusive right, though, by, by statute, and that's something that applies to all of the uh, SBIR agencies. Non-exclusive right for the government to use any IP that came out of the project. But you are free to develop and market to other to other agencies, non-government. In fact, they are encouraging that more and more. That non-exclusive right of licensing, could they turn around and license it themselves as well, go to a different manufacturer? No, because it's, it, you still own it. They can't get it through any other source but you that the owner. They can't turn around a license. So it's, it's, it's a license to use the technology. And in practice, it's unenforceable because by the time that you as a company develop a product that uses a piece of IP that's SBIR funded, some other IP maybe that isn't SBIR funded, some other operations that you've got in, but the government has no way of determining what percentage of the product that they buy is really a result of the IP that they've developed. So they rarely enforce this. They rarely say, well, we're buying from you, but we help fund it, so you have to give us a discount. They usually don't do that. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions? Can you repeat the questions so that the online? Yeah, good point. Yeah. Remind me if I forget again, I'm likely to do that. Sure. We have a, we have a couple of questions. So first, I'm going Great. to open the mic for the uh, Joseph Business Center, if you can, All right. if he has any questions. So, um, Hi, Chris, this is uh, Teresa. Do you have any questions at your center? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and open up the questions for the... This is Jason from uh, the WBDC. I submitted some questions via the chat. Do you want me to read them out loud or do you want to ask them from the chat? Sure, go ahead and if you could go ahead and read them out loud. Okay, so a couple questions are, um, how important is grant success related to the support of the local government officials when you're submitting a proposal? Uh, I couldn't quite hear that. Could you repeat the question, please? All right. Yeah, it had to do with uh, the importance of support from a local public official. Is that what he's asking? Um, you know, a letter of support from a local politician or legislator supporting the proposal does almost nothing for, for an SBIR proposal. In fact, quite often it's counterproductive because the agencies are very resistant to any sense of political influence on their decision-making process. And if they sense that some politician is trying to influence the process, their backs will get up, they will shut down. And so you really don't want, in most cases, a letter from a local politician. The only uh, exception to that might be if you are manufacturing a technology that the local politician would buy. You know, maybe you've got some kind of an election aid, big data 
uh, processing algorithm that you're developing, and the government agency might be a purchaser of that. Then as a purchase, they might validate your marketplace and help validate it with a letter saying, yes, we want this technology, we would buy it. But just in general, a letter of support from somebody who's not demonstrating market value is not going to do you a lot of good. Another question from the WBDC is, how do we protect our IP from phase one to phase two? The uh, yeah, good question, and this is this is a, a strong concern of always. You have to protect your IP. The agencies are very sensitive to this. They deal with this all the time. The agencies all know that unless they put in mechanisms to protect IP, they'll kill the goose that laid the golden egg. If anybody wants to participate but is afraid because of IT protection, they won't get the kinds of technology that they're looking for. So there are many, many safeguards built into the process. You can, in your proposal, designate sections that are proprietary if you have to. They discourage you from putting proprietary information into a proposal, but if you must, sometimes you can't help it in order to explain how it works. You can put a legend at the beginning of the proposal saying this proposal contains proprietary data. It's on pages 6, 8, and 12. And then where the proprietary data exists, you can mark that in the proposal. And then if later on there's a lawsuit or any question about the proposal, you'll be well marked and the government agency will not be allowed to make that public. That being said, there's really no way to protect, and I was mentioning this to Scott ahead of time, there's really no way to protect uh, uh, a reviewer from looking over your proposal, from saying, oh, this is a really good idea. In fact, this is a threat to the work that I'm gonna do. I'm gonna rate it really low so it doesn't get funded so that I can go ahead and fund it myself. You really can't do that, except that the reviewers are honor bound not to do that and the agencies take great pains to eliminate any competitive uh, interest or any conflicts of interest. With the NSF proposal, they give you a form to fill out to list anybody that might be a potential competitor, and they won't have them review. So they, they do put steps into control it as much as they have, as much as they can. They have to where the program wouldn't succeed. Two more questions. Yeah. If, if you could repeat them, this is my favorite. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, Success rate for fast track proposals. Success rate for fast track proposals. Since a fast track proposal, a fast track proposal is a phase one and two combined. Some of the agencies let you do that. Instead of having phase one and then waiting and then submitting phase two, you can submit a fast track proposal. It's a phase one and two combined. You put in that same information in both proposals. Um, and then the the success rate is about the same as a phase one proposal because it's a phase one just with a phase two tacked onto it. So the fast track itself doesn't raise your chances any. And the last question that we have right here is, do you need to incorporate before you apply for a grant? You do need to incorporate before you apply for a grant. The question was, do you need to incorporate? You must exist, at least on paper, as a business entity. And does it matter which business entity? Is there a higher success rate or easier if you're an S Corp, an LLC, or a C Corporation? Nope. I mean, and you technically could be a sole proprietorship and, um, and enter, but then you're giving your social security number as your taxpayer ID number, a lot of liability questions with that. You don't have to be up and running as a functioning company. You don't have to have a payroll. You don't have to have uh, books. You don't have to really have any operating system in place, but you have to have that taxpayer ID number and so you have to register as a corporation in order to do that. One more question that right. came in is, can you please define technology R&D? All right, technology research and development. Um, can I define this? That's an interesting question. I haven't had that before. Um, it, let's see, in fact, well, let me have a follow-up question. What, what is the question here? Because it is research and development. It's investigation and development of new technologies. So what's behind that question? I sense that there's an issue, a deeper issue to address here. They're trying to unmute their mic. Um, let me see if I can unmute their mic. Anybody with, that's online can ping and get a very fancy definition from the government. I, I've read these definitions and it's full of jargon and buzzwords. 
it doesn't mean any anything more than what you already would think of from research and development. Connected with difference between basic research and innovative research. Um, both would be considered in, as research and development. Uh, the question is, you know, is, is research and development different from basic research or is there a difference in innovative research and basic research? These are very broad general definitions um, that you probably could find some distinction. But I think we need to know what, what he's really getting at here. What they're asking for specifically is electronic technology versus physical product technology. Does it all qualify? Oh, okay, yeah, that one. Yes, electronic technology, physical technology, cell biology technology, any new, any new technology would all qualify. All right, all right, yeah, so that, that, that's a good question to ask. Anything that's new in technology in the field, anything that addresses these goals. That all qualifies as, as research and technology or research and development. The trick, as I said, is to find the right spot in the technology transfer, or technology readiness level, TRL. For those who, who know this uh, level, the TRL is like a seven lower nine, nine levels of technology readiness, where one is basic research and nine is ready to put on the market, the product is available. And you want a TRL of about two to four with the SBIR program. So you want it to be a couple stages beyond basic research to where you, you're ready to begin serious work on making it an application. But if you've already got it patented, if you're sure that it's gonna work, you don't need SBIR funding. You're a little past the level of innovation that they're looking for. Other questions? All right, so what does it take to be eligible for this program? Well, you have to be a small business. It is a small business innovative research program after all. But you'd be pretty big and still be considered a small business, 500 people. So, you know, Boeing wouldn't apply. Amazon, Google, these can't apply for SBIR proposals. But 400, 450 people, that's a pretty good size. You can get SBIR proposals. You have to be for profit. Not for profit agencies are not eligible. Universities are not eligible. Research institutions are not eligible. You have to be owned at least 51% by U.S. citizens or lawful resident aliens. So it's got to be a U.S. company. The U.S. doesn't want to put U.S. dollars to fund foreign companies. They want it to fund U.S. companies. For SBIR, at least two-thirds of the work has to be done by the, the firm. They don't want to see a pass-through. They want a firm that's going to be successful in the long run. So two-thirds of the work has to be done by the local business concern. Um, one-third for sub-awards, and that's measured by the budget, one-third for sub-awards, consultants, any other outsiders. Two-thirds, one-third. With SBF, with, with STTR, the small business concern has to do at least 40% of the work. The, the federal research institution has to do at least 30% of the work. So that leaves uh, 30, 40, 70, 30% of the work that could be variable in between them. And the Principal investigator, the guy who's running the program, has to be employed by the company full time. And they define full time as being at least a 51% appointment with the company that's making the proposal and less than 20 hours a week working for all other sources. So if you're a full time faculty member and you say, well, you know, I can do this on the side, my faculty appointment is a 40 hour a week assignment. And I'm a hard worker, so I can work 40 hours a week on the project, on this company. I work 80 hours a week, no problem. I'm full-time for both places. No, that won't fly. That won't work. You have to really be full-time for the company, 51%, and then uh, no, no more than 20 hours for any other. So those are the primary eligibility requirements, and these are the ones that go across all agencies. All right, so... Those are the basic eligibility requirements. There are a few others, but those are the main ones. What does it take to be competitive? Well, first of all, you have to meet those primary goals that we discussed earlier on. So who remembers what those primary goals were? Primary goals of the program. Yeah, 
Yeah, I was afraid of this. <laughs> slide three. Remember back at slide three? You have to meet federal research goals. It's got to be a defined topic area in the solicitation. It has to be innovative enough to be interesting. It's got to have an element of risk, high risk, high payoffs, what they're looking for. It has to be commercializable. And ideally, it'll also serve some other societal benefits. These are the key areas. One, one of the many beauties of this program is that it's appropriately named. Small Business Innovative Research is really for Small Business Innovative Research, a federal program whose name actually means what the product is. Hallelujah. You also have to have the high risk, high payoff that I talked about. You have to have some reason to believe this is going to work. You haven't proven feasibility yet. That's what phase one is for. But you have to have enough work towards it to say, we believe that this is really going to be successful. Um, it's got to be state-of-the-art technology. You have to prove that you are doing something that nobody else has done and that no one else is in the process of doing and not likely to do. This requires a vast knowledge of the current field. If it's research area, you have to know what everybody else is doing in order to make the case that we're doing something that's brand new. In the review panel, and we'll talk about that in a minute, the reviewers will be among the best and the brightest. NSF, NIH, they can command the attention of the leaders of any field in technology, and they will get them to come and review the proposal. They will know what everybody's doing. They will know the latest and greatest for the state of the art. You've got to place yourself as one of those leaders. And to do that, you've got to show that you're aware of everything else that's going on. So you need a very nice bibliography and a little nice uh, presentation of that in your work plan saying, here's what's going on. Here's why we're doing something that no one else is doing. Here's how we're drawing and adapting from the latest and greatest. Here's how we're moving the state of knowledge forward. You have to have a qualified team. Qualified team doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have a PhD. NSF makes a big deal about saying, we fund undergraduates, we fund graduate students, and they do. Some of their most successful projects are graduate students, sometimes even undergraduate students. NIH tends to pay a little more attention to credentials than the National Science Foundation. In fact, when you read a review panel, I've read several of these, you read, uh, you know that the NSF reviewers look at your summary, they understand what it's all about, and then they look at the letters of support to see how engaged you are with the community and the marketplace. At IH, they'll look at the summary, get an idea of what it's all about, and then they'll skip to the bio sketches and see about the credentials of the people that you have on the team. That's what they pay the most attention to. You have to have a sound research plan. You can't just say, oh yeah, we're gonna think about this and figure out exactly what we need to do. But step by step, what goes into that plan, and we'll talk about in the deeper dive, we'll talk about what goes into some of these sections. But you need to have a very sound research plan. It's got to be, yes, really, this is how it's going to work. This is how it's going to run. And you have to have letters of support. They're more and more important all the time. I will talk more about letters of support later on. They are critical. So those are some things that you also have to have to be competitive. There was a question. Okay. All right. So if you're thinking about whether uh, SBI is appropriate for you, some of the obvious things to look at that we've talked about. Technology itself has to be new. It's got to be in moving the state of the art forward. Some evidence of this, if you have results that are patentable or about to be patentable, that's a good sign that it's something new. If the U.S. Patent Office recognizes it as new, it's going to be new. Uh, if it's going to result in some publications, that's a good sign. So look for some of these indicators to show that, yes, it is a solid new proposal. It's got to be ready for practice or about at least beyond the basic research level. That's that TRL level that I was talking about. You have to have evidence that somebody will actually buy this product. Uh, the, the typical problem over the course of the years is uh, an engineer develops, you know, a grad student develops something that's so cool. He's thinking, man, this technology is so cool that certainly lots of people would buy it. Millions of people have to want this technology. They've got to. Uh, and that's not going to fly. That's a theoretical, imagined marketplace. You really have to be engaged with the marketplace and show that some people have demonstrated they really do want this. Not that you think that they ought to want it, but that they really do. Uh, it also helps to be aware of the distribution channels. 
even if people want it, how do you get it to them? And so that's part of your commercialization plan is to show that you are aware of the marketplace and you know how to penetrate that marketplace. Um, you have to show that you've got enough oomph, financial and other resources behind the company to manage all the costs that are beyond the research and development costs. I mentioned before the quality of the team, you have to have qualified people. If it's an undergraduate, it better be a pretty bright undergraduate who's aware of what's going on. Goals have to be realistic. Uh, typical problem, promising too much. People tend to overpromise in phase one. Phase one, you're not really developing a whole product, you're just proving feasibility. So that plan has to be feasible. Team itself has to be well-rounded. It helps to have some business experience, some marketing experience, not just technology people. And it helps if you can address societal concerns. So these are the main green lights. Those of you who are advising proposals or those of you with companies, look over these. What are some of the red flags? It's just the opposite of them. Modest incremental technological developments aren't gonna be of great interest. If you're not really aware of what else is going on in the field, your proposal won't be as strong. If you talk way more about your technology in the proposal than you do about the marketplace, that's a sign that you're a little skewed, you're a little technology heavy and not business oriented enough. If your market size estimates are purely theoretical, you know, this is a billion dollar business and we're gonna get $1 million of it. And even if we get 10% of that, we're still at $100,000 in year one. And certainly people can get 10, you know, we can get 10% of that. That's a theoretical plan. It's important to have some of that market data, but it's not sufficient. If you're not aware of how the product can get to the customer, the distribution channels, the costing factors, if you're not aware of who else is out there that you're competing against, if you're expecting the grant dollars to do business development, that's not what the program is up for. You can get some assistance, but the company or the government expects the business development to come by an error from the business itself. And, you know, ahead of time, if you're not willing to spend a lot of time on the proposal, the proposal is a serious effort. It takes a while to put these things together. You have to be willing to dedicate a serious amount of time in order to do it. Summary slide here, some trade-offs. So, Beautiful as a funding source, over one and a half million dollars. Non-diluted, company owns the IP, company owns all the equity, government has none of that. You get additional commercialization support, lots of add-on money, lots of um, i and technical and other business assistance you're eligible for. And you get to validate your technology and team to potential investors. Great boost for your investment search. Cons, um, no, it's limited. If you want to develop a product that already exists and you just need a beta prototype and money to do a beta prototype on technology you've already developed, this program is not going to fund that. It does take a lot of time and effort and the odds are not that great. 15% for a few months of your time, is it really worth that effort for that to be a concern? You've got to ask yourself that question. Long turnaround time. From the time that the solicitation comes out to the time that you're funded is a year. From the time that you submit the proposal, through the time that you're funded is easily half a year. That's phase one, and then you go through the same cycle for phase two. So even though the program is maybe a year in phase one and two years in phase two, you tack on a few years of proposal writing that, you're talking about a four to five year kind of time frame. And young, volatile entrepreneurial businesses usually have to move a little faster than that. So are you willing to sustain that kind of a time? There's a gap between phases which is lessening that the agencies are wising up to the gap between phase one and phase two, and there are ways to work around the gap, but there still is a gap that we have to be concerned about. Um, it does require upfront funding, not just time to fund it. A lot of times you need to fund resource and development dollars yourself and then get reimbursed. With NASA, with the Department of Defense, with the Department of Energy, these are all reimbursement contracts. You have to pay for it upfront and then you get reimbursed later on. And even with NSF, where it's a grant, you get a lump of money upfront, but you don't get the last 25000 until after you've submitted the final report. So that last chunk of $25,000, you have to fund yourself. You need to find that funding. And this is not sufficient for a startup. You can't just say, well, I'll get an SDR grant, and then that will help me run the company. It will help with your research and development. You can get some add-on for commercialization, but that alone is not sufficient to run a strong company. So those are the main pros and cons. So here we are, right on time, we're close, about 9.30. Let's pause now, we'll take a break in a minute, but before we do, let's pause and see what questions we have locally, and any comments or experiences to share.
maybe this will initiate discussion. We do have a question from our um, Women's Business Development Center in Chicago. All right. Um, can you discuss the different types of reviewers, science focused versus business focused? Yes, and I will talk, I've got a slide on that later on. Quick preview though, almost always there are two kinds of reviewers. Half of them are business, half of them are technology. And so you get both represented and in your proposal, it's critical that you address both audiences. So that's kind of the summary statement. There are different, usually both are represented. Sometimes like with NSF, they sit on opposite sides of the table. You got a six person team and the commercial reviewers would be on one side and the technical reviewers would be on another side conferring with each other. And then you have to address both audiences as critical for the success of the proposal. So that's a good question. And we'll talk more about that later. I do not see any more questions um, from online or the host. So okay. Find... Oh, wait, we do have another one. Already? Uh, can you comment a little on the PI requirement to be full time? When does the PI have? To be hired. Oh yeah, good question. When does the PI have to be hired? The PI does not have to be full time for the company when you write the proposal. That's important to note. The PI does have to be full time for the company when the proposal begins and through the entire stage of the proposal until it ends. So one year proposal, that PI will have to be there full time for that one year. But before and after, no requirements. Yeah. All right, the question is how does university faculty work? And it, it really depends on the situation. A lot of times the faculty member will be a co-owner of the company. And in that case, the faculty member has to be paid by the company for his involvement with the SBIR work. Now the faculty member is not gonna be a PI because he's a full-time researcher, he can't work full-time, but if he's a company owner, he can be on the employee payroll and be paid by the company. The faculty member can't be a consultant to the proposal. He's got to be employed by the company in that particular case. Sometimes faculty members, their company will hire the faculty member's lab to be the research partner. So that's an obvious conflict of interest. If the faculty member owns the company and the company is, is doing the lab, then you have to be very aware of the conflict of interest there. At the University of Illinois, the Office of Vice Chancellor for Research handles these kinds of issues all the time. They have a review process, and if you want to run that process, um, then you have to go to the vice chancellor's office and go through their protocol, make sure it's cleared with them, and then they say, okay, you have to put a few safeguards in place, and then they're okay with it, but they, you learn what they are, and you monitor what they are. How it works at SIU, I'm not sure. I would imagine they've got, in fact, Kelly, actually, you have an answer for that. You. All right, yeah, so at SIU, there's a similar process. Which office is it, by the way? Okay, so, you, yeah, yeah. So in SIU, the Office of Sponsored Research collaborates with the Vice Chancellor's Office to address these uh, uh, clauses. Now, here's, a, even within a, a little aside here, even within an agency, you'll get discrepancies. And this just came up recently with me. I, I've, I've had uh, an NSF award uh, from a couple of years ago where the program manager said, well, the faculty member whose lab is being subcontracted, that's perfectly fine, but he's got to get money from the company, but he can't get paid as the sub-awardee. All right, fine. So he's got to be paid by the company, but not the sub-awardee, but he can go ahead and lead the lab effort. Just uh, last week, I got another client from another program manager at NSF, same situation. That program manager said, you can't do that. You can't have the faculty member being an owner and also leading the, the lab. You have to find some kind of a substitute PI to lead the lab work. So you know, NSF will tell you two different things, and they're adamant, they're absolutely sure about this. One says you have to do it this way, the other says you can't do it that way. Yeah. To build on that question more specifically, 
what happens if the PI leaves the company during the project? Can another individual be named as the PI? You can change the PI, but it's highly discouraged. They hate that. And it makes sense because when they fund the proposal, they're funding the qualifications of the individual that they spent a lot of time to review and vet and make sure that individual is qualified. If you turn around and say, oh, we're getting somebody else, then suddenly they've got to vet that person. They've got to look, spend a lot of time. Is this person qualified as well? I mean, it's going to happen. It's a volatile industry. People will change. They can't help it. But uh, there have been awards just turned off. If the PI leaves, then they say, no, we funded the PI, this PI to do this work. But, but that requires approval of the program manager and there's a protocol. All the agencies have a protocol you go through to change the PI. Lower level staff, by the way, not a problem. In your proposal, you can list that you're gonna hire somebody to be determined as other personnel, lab work, assay work. You know, we will hire an undergraduate to do some standard uh, histology, assay, <laughs> pardon me, some assays. And then they don't really care who you hire. It's pretty standard work, not a big deal. We do have two more questions All right. uh, from online. This is a percentage of eligibility question. What percentage of work for technology development product needs to be done locally? How does SBIR percentage work? Is it hours of PI, hours across different companies, US versus overseas collaboration? Uh, overseas work will not be funded by, the, so the, you know, the question is, what percentage of work and how do you measure it for the U.S. companies, which is an excellent question. The overseas work will not be funded by SBIR except in very rare instances. The default is that you can't have any work done overseas. If there's collaboration overseas and you have to have something done overseas, you can apply for a waiver, but they don't like to do that. It, uh, the question was worded is how much has to be local, and if you define local as the United States, then the default is 100% of the United States. If local means your community, that doesn't matter as long as it's in the United States. Have one more question. All right. Can you go into TRL levels? How do I know if my technology is too far along? Does the same level of technology testing or validation add credibility and win a proposal? Is it more likely to win a proposal? Yeah. Okay, I, I hope that the, the question is, you know, how do you know where you are in the TRL level? Uh, I'll give some general advice, but sign up for a one-on-one. -on -one. That sounds like a one-on-one -on -one question because it really does depend on the state of that particular technology. In general, you can Google TRL levels and, and get a, a quick explanation. Maybe I'll put a slide in the future session. That sounds like a good, good suggestion for an additional slide. I'll add one. But... Uh, the, the two tests that I offered in the green light slide, you know, is, it, is your work going to be patentable? Is it um, going to be publishable? Is it gonna require some kind of protection, trade secret protection, even if it's not patented, there are lots of ways to protect IP besides patenting. Is it gonna require some protection? Uh, those are good tests for the level of innovation. Uh, tests for whether it's far enough, too far along would be, you know, is it ready to sell in, in general? So those are some general guidance. Beyond that, you can find really good information on the web. I hope that answered the question, but yeah, sign up for a session because that sounds like it's specific to your technology. Okay. All right, so 10 minute break or so. Great questions, yeah. All right, so, yeah. Uh, so we can stay on track. Let's take a 10 minute break instead of 15. Okay. Awesome. Great. I think they can hear us now. Okay, part two, the deeper dive. And the deeper dive is actually subdivided into three parts. The first three bullets will be one slide deck, and then I'll pause for questions. The next uh, one, two, three, four, five bullets are part three, the elements of a strong proposal. And then I've got a uh, shorter session on ad administering a grant and the implications it has for your company if it's already up and running some things you'll need to do if you're just getting started as a company. All right, so part two, resource uh, process and timeline. And I'm gonna go over the timeline here of a typical proposal. Each one is a little bit different. And the goal of the timeline is going to be more scope of effort. 
then exactly you have to do things at this time, but it'll give you a sense of what else is involved in the process. But key point here, developing a strong proposal has a lot more to do with research, planning, legwork, commercialization work than it does with writing. We use the term proposal writing. I don't like the term proposal writing because while writing is very important, it's really this much of the proposal. And positioning yourself to be a strong company is the bulk of the work. That's the lion's share of the portion of the work. When you, you, you need to do the significance and need section in a way that positions yourself as a leader in the field. I alluded to this earlier when I was talking about some of the competitive aspects. You've got to show that you're on top of the field, that you're doing things that no one else has done, which means a lot of research into what else is being done. You, should, you have to position yourself as a company that's current, state of the art. You have to understand the commercial uh, landscape. If you say that you're going to produce a product that's going to go out there and disrupt the industry, what, which is a good thing in the SBI world, they love disruption. Um, <laughs> What's, what are you going to disrupt? Who are you going to disrupt? What current incumbents are you going to attack? Are you current, current, going to currently displace in your proposal? Um, collaboration building takes a lot of time. The letters of support are very important. Choosing the right university partner is very important. Understanding a commercialization partner, developing ties with a distributor chain, or with Amazon, if you expect to be on Amazon, or a local hardware company, if you expect to work through local hardware companies, or if you expect to sell directly on the internet, understanding some of the vagaries of what it's like to work on the internet. If you think you're gonna get Kickstarter funding, which is viable um, as a support investment kind of tool, how are you gonna go about that? What premiums are you going to offer? What does that look like? You have to show that you understand this, not just that you can talk about it in big general terms, but that you really understand it. And you have to do a lot of work in planning. The work plan itself, the technical work plan, often gets overlooked in SBI presentations, but it's still critical. Because as I said, NSF, NIH, Department of Energy, these federal agencies will command the best and brightest in any industry. And they will pick your research plan apart. If it has a hole, if it has a gap, you've got to be prepared to address that. Your budget takes time to develop and you have to figure out how you're going to prove feasibility. Sometimes that's not trivial. Which aspects of the technology, and I'll talk more about all these in later slides uh, in the elements uh, section. This is a lot of planning work that you need to do to have a very sound plan that you can prove whether it's successful or not. If you have. More positioning, more research, more planning than actual writing. Key point, commonly overlooked. Also, more project management. Now, it takes one to three person months, time on task to develop a proposal. I have asked several people who have developed proposals how much it takes, and this is a pretty typical response. Do you have any sense, Ashley? Uh, you know, do, do you have any feel for how much time people have to spend on it? I mean, I, you can get brought in kind of later in the day. Yeah. The office does like to really speak to the involvement prior to that, but I would say that we can probably fully on our end, especially if we have to pay any type of conflict of interest. Yeah, so I mean, even the conflict of interest, there's 10 hours of work there, yeah. and so maybe 20. Even that little part of the effort, which is not a major part of the whole proposal, it's critical, you have to do it, but there's you know 20 hours right there. These little areas tend to add up and you get to a total of one to three person months time on task. And this is not one to three person months of a grad, an undergraduate student who hasn't done it before. This is one to three person months of PhD level people who are really used to putting together things quickly, who are used to jotting out uh, programs, who are used to developing papers. It's not like an assignment where you write up the paper and then you're done with it and you hand it in. There's a lot more involved with that. So you have to plan it. You have to plan it like you plan any three month effort. You have to think through the timeline, think through who's going to do which tasks, make sure that you're not putting it off into the last minute, typical problem, because unless you plan it carefully, this amount of time, three to four person months, or sometimes it is four person months, that's not uh, outlandish. How much is that worth? How much is that time worth? Unless you manage it carefully, unless you avoid a last minute delivery, all that hard work, just flies out the window. 
and you're going to be rejected. So you don't want to put that level of effort at risk by waiting to the last minute by not timing carefully. So let's look over an example development timeline. And here, as I said, the, the goal is for you to get a sense for the scope of the tasks that are involved, the types of tasks, not to exactly do according to this timeline. But you want to start like two, three months ahead of the deadline. Usually the solicitations are available two, three months ahead of the deadline. These are weeks, so you know, 10 weeks or more ahead of the deadline. You want to repeat, repeat, uh, read the program guidelines carefully. Look them over. What is this agency looking for? What topic or topics are we going to address? And I, I recommend drafting what I call a case statement or a summary document. Once you understand what you're going to do, once you understand what the agency wants, then never mind the proposal format. Write on your own separate paper. These are the main points. These are the main reasons we're going to be funded. This is the case that we're going to make. Here is the core of our argument. And then the bulk of your proposal work, all the research, the planning, the collaboration building, is supporting those main points. If you say our technology is going to do great things that it never, it's going to cure cancer. How are you going to prove that this could cure cancer? Or at least how are you going to show that you have confidence in that? There's a lot of research in that. If you say that millions of people will buy your product, how are you going to support that millions of people really will buy your product? There's a lot of legwork to do that. So outline the main points, and then that will guide your research effort. Later on, you have to make sure that those main points find their way into the proposal guidelines according to the format of the proposal. But you can do that later on. The important thing is you have the main points, and that guides your effort. Uh, contacting the program officers, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But that's important to do as well. With NSF, it's automatic. With others, it's not automatic. You can send them an uh, email. Well, I'll talk more about that. But like a good uh, 10 weeks ahead of time is a good time to do that. Also, it's a good time to start identifying your partners. If you have a letter of support from a large company, it will have to go up the chain of command. It will have to come down the chain of command. It might not be what you want. It might have to go up again. It might have to come down again. There's several weeks involved with that. There's negotiating in order to determine what they're willing to say in the proposal. Are they willing to give you any part in the letter of support? Are they willing to state for the record that they're committed to this effort, that they will apply some person time or provide lab space or do something by way of commitment? It takes time to negotiate what really goes into that letter. About six weeks ahead of time, if not earlier, there are a whole lot of registrations that you need to go through. Don't wait for these. These can be killers. The registration is the one aspect of proposal development where working on the proposal is not necessarily the same as working on the business. In most other cases, everything that you do here to develop a strong proposal also helps you develop a strong business. It's good for the business, not just for the proposal, except for all these registrations. And you can spend weeks on the registrations. I've got a list of them in a later slide, but for now, Registrations are important. Get them out of the way. They can hang you up and they can kill you at the end when it really hurts. Uh, you know, a good month ahead of time, an initial draft of the proposal. Have it ready. You know, bullet points some places, text in most places, holes in some places, that's fine. Does it flow well? Does it read well? Is it all linked together? Does it work? A couple weeks ahead of time, you want to have a complete draft of the proposal. Budget figures mostly in place. Letters of support, mostly in place. Letters of a commitment from your research institution, mostly in place, or very nearly so. And at this stage, a couple weeks ahead of time, here's where the really great proposals are distinguished because here's where you can get a review cycle, a couple review cycles. You get a red team, what's called a tiger team. Someone who hasn't seen the proposal before but understands the technology, give it to them. Ask them for their feedback and allow some time so that you can address the feedback. Because if you've been working on the proposal intensely for this amount of time, there will be some gaps that you will be blind to because you're too close to it. You need an outsider to come in and identify those gaps for you. You need to allow yourself some time to address those gaps when they come up. A week ahead of time. Good, good time to plan on submitting. Uh, maybe not exactly a week of time, but if something goes wrong with the submission process, and it often does, you have time to recover. You do not want to wait until the last minute to submit. Um, I've got lots of stories about problems that happened um, in, in the last minute. 
I'll, I'll share one with you now. I was working at my home computers, uh, working with a client, uh, submitting a proposal, try as I can. They don't always heed my advice. So it was last minute, I was after the proposal, working away at my computer because I'm doing the submission for them, all electronic, and a squirrel ate through a power cord in the transformer right outside my house and blew off power to the whole neighborhood. No power, no computer, nothing. What do you do? Last minute, no way to recover. Well, we did have a way to recover. I've got a laptop, I pulled out the laptop. Uh, the internet still was accessible, so I was able on my laptop to do the final stages of submission. We were able to recover with a lot of sweat. Squirrel, not so lucky. <laughs> He didn't recover. But you don't want to put yourself in that situation. Something will happen that you cannot foresee and you won't be able to recover. You need to make it so that you protect that investment that you have. All right, and once you've submitted, the next task is wait and wait and wait and wait. And maybe if you're lucky, within three months, you'll hear something. Quite often it's four months, that's not too unusual. And what you hear at that time is you've been selected for an award, but you have to fill out a, a financial administration questionnaire and we have some other questions to ask you. So there's a whole nother round that feels a lot like another proposal at that stage. And NSF makes it seem like you're delinquent. They say, you did not fill out this, you must do this, you must do that. You're wrong, wrong, wrong. And, you know, they never asked for this stuff before, but they tell you you're wrong because you haven't submitted it yet. That's still a good sign, though. They're still asking you for information at this point. If they don't want to find you, they won't ask for any information. And then, maybe four months after the submission, give or take, you either get rejected or you get an award. If you get rejected, uh, then ask for a debrief. With NSF, you'll get the debrief automatically. With NIH, you have to sign it to ERA Commons. The debrief will be there with the Department of Defense. You have to request it uh, through the Defense Business uh, website. But you did request the debrief, get it from them, because that's informative. A lot of times, success with an SBIR proposal is a two-submission or even three-submission process. You learn a lot from the review comments. In the first one, you resubmit. No black mark resubmitting. That's a good thing if you pay attention and make the changes that they say. No problem there. Third time, you know, they're beginning to wonder, did they really address the concerns here? If you get rejected three times, you probably should give up. That's not a hard and fast rule, but in general, three times, it's not gonna work. But up to three times, quite often, that's what it takes to get funded. You can submit to multiple agencies. You can submit a proposal to one agency and to another agency at the same time, as long as you tell the second agency that you've applied, and as long as you don't receive money from both agencies. You could apply to different agencies, but you can't receive money from, from different agencies for the same work. But no problem applying to both. And in fact, all the registration forms have a box that you can check whether you're submitting similar or overlapping work, it's a jargon, to another agency. And you just click yes, and you describe it. So, like I said, at that point, you can reapply. All right, uh, I'm gonna talk about those registrations now, but do we have any award winners who've agreed? We've got a couple people from the remote site signed up who, who have applied for and received awards. And uh, are they online? Okay. I'm gonna ask again. Yeah. Maybe someone didn't disclose. Yeah, perhaps. Has anybody in the room here uh, gone through the process, applied, or at least started to apply? Nothing yet. Oh, you started. Okay. So, based on your starting, is this consistent with what you are experiencing? Yes, yeah, so, so we didn't. Um, we underestimated the time of filling out the registration. Ah, yeah. Can you repeat that? So. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one person has started an application here. Maureen did, and she underestimated the registration time. And so they're bumping into the registration problem. Any uh, procedural advice, Ashley, Kelly, from your standpoint? I know, I know you get people later on in the cycle, but. Um, again, with a lot of your best time to register, making sure that you have um, the partners that you're bringing on have the appropriate 
appropriate registration is not Oh, yes, that's a good point. Uh, your your sub-awardees oftentimes have to be registered in the agencies as well. So let's go ahead and look at some of the registrations. As I mentioned before, in response to Scott's question, you have to have a corporate entity. It has to have a, a taxpayer ID number with the IRS. You also have to have a DUNS number. Um, universal numbering system must get the DUNS number and you get it from Dun & Bradstreet right now. As of next year, you will get it from SAM.gov. This is changing. Uh, so it's gonna be even worse to get it next year. Right now, it's free from DUNS, from Dun & Bradstreet. Well, it's technically free, but the real cost is that they will hound you forever to, to kick in another $200 and another $400. Somebody looked at your business and unless you have the full $400 package, they will think that you're discredited as business. Don't you want to buy the $400 package? Don't you want to assure that your business is often, uh, you know, in very good light? And you don't, don't, don't do that. I mean, you can if you want to, but you don't need to. Don't, don't pay any <clears throat> extra money to Dun & Bradstreet unless you really want the package. You don't have to. You will get out of it all the time. Sam.gov you have to register in. This is a monster. It's a bear. It takes a couple hours to do the registration process with all the forms that you have to fill out and all the bars that you have to click. Uh, and even then, there is, there's several weeks involved with getting approved. You get an active status. You have to submit a separate uh, document that's signed and notarized that you fax or mail to them. And then they have to approve that until you're fully authorized. Sam.gov is ab absolutely abysmal. And it's just a monster to, to try and work with. In June, I was at the SBIR conference in Boston, annual SBIR conference. The agencies all complained about SAM, and they said there's nothing we can do about it because SAM was federally mandated by the Congress outside of our agency. So we all encourage you to write to your congressperson and complain about SAM. They were saying, please write to your congressperson. Please get it fixed. It's not really good. Yeah. Can we take a moment to just highlight, for those who might not know, some of the resources that are available to help them through these registration processes, like the PTAC that uh, is around uh, on some of the host sites and throughout the state, and also uh, the Small Business Development Center with the business entity and those types of things. And I think Allison or Teresa can probably yeah, speak actually, to Yeah, I've got a slide on that. Okay. So Perfect. we'll go ahead with, if it's okay, we can go ahead with the process now, and then we will talk about those resources because that is very important. That's a good point. I want to make sure and cover that. Uh, Grants.gov, some of the, oh, question? Um, yes, just to clarify, uh, one of the online viewers, the, when you use, use the term cor corporate entity, it can certainly be a sole proprietor, LLC, S Corp. It's any formal, formally organized entity. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily have to be a corporation. Well, an S Corp is a corporation, a C Corp is a corporation. Sole proprietor, though. Sole proprietor is not a corporation. An LLC, limited liability corporation. Yeah, so it could be a sole proprietorship, but that's not recommended. Just because you don't have any legal protection, then, then there's no difference between you and the company. So anything the company does is your personal uh, name behind it. Some agencies require uh, additional registration in grants.gov. And to get access to grants.gov, you also have to have, uh, a oh no, sam.gov, going back to sam.gov, you also have to re have a registration in login.gov, they have access to sam.gov. You don't just register for sam.gov, you get login.gov and that gives you access to sam.gov. Some agencies require grants.gov registration, most of them do. Uh, the SBA has a registry, you have to sign up for the SBA registry. And this one is really easy to do. You just sign up and you're done. It's quick. But you don't want to have to. You don't want to forget it. Uh, but you do have to sign up for that registry as well. So these are the registrations that most all of the SBR agencies require. In addition to that, the agencies themselves require registrations in their site. Many of them, as I said, require grants.gov. The DOD also requires you to register in sbrdefensebusiness.org. DOE, Energy, FedConnect, and PAMS. NASA has an electronic handbook that's their handbook. NIH, you have to have a login with ERA Commons, and so does your sub-awardee. You use their ASSIST framework for your actual application. NSF, you log into research.gov, but their uh, proposal application package is Fastlane. 
So you have to be registered with that. And again, thank you for the reminder, your sub-awardees also have to be registered here. Uh, DOT, you have to, that's transportation, you have to be the Volpe Center. They've got their own website. Department of Education, you just email the proposal in. It's the easiest. You email them the proposal. You have to have a grants.gov registration, but you can just email them the proposal. It's the slickest, the nicest. Uh, another point that I'll mention here is if you are a faculty member and, and you already have access to ELA Commons or research.gov through your institution, you need an additional login through Fastlane or ERA Commons for your company because it is the company that's making the proposal, not the institution. So you have to have a separate application or a separate uh, login for those as well. So you leave yourself plenty of time. You can see how complicated this can get. And Maureen's dealing with it now. What are your, I mean, what's hanging you up? Oh, I, it was just the, um, the NIAGR comments and the research.gov. We have all the other things. Uh -huh. So you can establish the level of making the transition between those. Uh, right. The piece of history here uh, in the 1980s, maybe the 90s, um, the government decided that there are a lot of websites out there. Wouldn't it be great if we had just one website for all these federal agencies? And so they developed grants.gov as that. And grants.gov was so horribly implemented that the agencies all rebelled. And the Congress really pushed on all the agencies, and most of the work, most of the time it got its way, but NSF was a little stronger. NSF somehow resisted the requirement to submit everything in grants.gov only and they won out and so fast lane still continued there was about a two-year time frame where you could submit either in fast lane or grants.gov nsf won that battle and having established the precedent now all the agencies have their own website so you have to learn a different website for a different agency but you know even the time spent learning all those websites for all the agencies as painful as it is it's still better than grants.gov because they're all better than grants.gov. Grants.gov has gotten a lot better. It's a lot better than it used to be. Still not the greatest site. Sam.gov has the worst uh, one right now. All right, now I will talk a little bit about agency interactions and reviews, how you go about contacting that agent, how you get in touch with them, some techniques for that. But again, beforehand, any questions that I can answer at this point? Yes. Okay, great. Uh one comment is to make sure that we repeat the local questions so that they can be hear, heard over the, the webinar. Yes, thank you for the reminder. We'll try and remember. Yes. The comment was, will we repeat local questions? <laughs> <laughs> if I had a smiley emoji on my chat, I'm sure I would get that right now. Um, and then at the point when you start going into the uh, panel review, um, we could open it up for someone to share their experience with the, the panel review section. Okay. Do you have a reviewer there or? Yes. Okay, oh, great, great. Yeah, so we'll make sure and do that. She said, will somebody please open it up when we have the panel review section to an individual who's got some experience? That will be valuable, I look forward to that. All right, it is important to get in touch with the agencies ahead of time if you possibly can. It isn't always easy to do, but if you can, very informative. Um, the, the interaction and guidance can help. They can tell you if you're on track, if you're off track, if they see some red flags right away, they'll say, yes, we have some concerns in this area. If you're NIH and you get in touch with one agency and they say, well, you know, this agency really isn't the most appropriate. I think you should go to another agency. They'll shepherd that process for you and they'll help you identify the best agency because it's not always clear. USDA, the same thing. I had one client oh, recently, just, just uh, last year, could have applied to two agencies call up USDA, uh, two, they're not agencies, but they're directors within USDA, and got both program managers on the line, and they discussed in real time which one would be more appropriate. And they said, yeah, okay, I think it's more appropriate for the second one. So she was able to better direct her uh, proposal at the time. If you don't guess right, the agency will help you anyway. If you submit to the wrong one or there's a better one, they will um, advise you. So you know, finding the right agency or sub-agency or topic area is, is not a major concern. They can usually help you with that. You'd have to be respectful of their time. Imagine how many of these they're going through. 
The National Science Foundation has uh, about nine different program officers whose full-time job is the SBIR program. They don't do anything but manage SBIRs for NSF. NSF is the only agency that does that. All the other agencies, program directors are doing something else full-time and SBIR is something they have to do on the side. So they've got to shoehorn this into all the rest of the activities that they have. So you have to be very respectful of that time. When you request a time by phone call or by email, you say, can I take 15 minutes of your time or 20 minutes of your time and put a time on it so that you demonstrate and communicate up front that you're respectful of that time. What you want to prepare is a one-page summary of the document. And this is something you can embed in email if it's short enough or if you need to attach it, and maybe it's got some graphics in it, you can attach it. Short, brief, to the point, and it needs to mention what's of interest to the funding agency. If you spend the whole time saying our technology is great, our technology is great, it's going to do all this stuff, but you haven't really addressed their priorities, you're going to miss the mark. So once you read through the solicitation, and you will have done this before you submit this letter, you'll see their priorities, you'll see their evaluation criteria, and you write saying, we will meet your goal by, and then you say how you're going to meet their goal, how you're going to further their mission. But phrase it in terms of what means something to them. Uh, who cares why relates to their priorities. Uh, there's a, I, I have submitted uh, a, a separate slide deck that gives you some advice on preparing for the one-on-one -on -one meeting. It's one that I got when I was in Boston in June. And is that slide deck uh, online yet, do you know? Okay, so that's available. I'm not gonna go over it here, but it's a resource that's available to you. So check with the resources online. There's some draft templates there. There's a draft. Um, quad chart, the Department of Defense loves these quad charts, the PowerPoint slides, with the four different components in them, and that's why they call it a quad chart. You can look online and see how they like to do it. A lot of times, one agency will have a slightly different version than another agency. You want to get the version that's appropriate for a particular agency, uh, and then you can really hit the mark. So that's what you do ahead of time. During the phone call, uh, be prepared with your questions. You might have a few questions that you put in the email saying these are the areas we want to discuss, but be prepared with some knowledgeable pointed questions. Don't ask them anything that you can already read about in the proposal guidelines. If you have a question about interpretation, that's good to ask. If you have a question about is this appropriate, is this the kind of thing that you're interested in, that's good to ask. Uh, so you want to read the solicitation very well ahead of time and avoid the temptation to tell people how great your technology is because they don't really want to hear it. They, 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 they'll know that you'll make your case in the proposal. All they need to know is what it's about now, what you're trying to do, not how great it is. Unless you can make the case, it's going to really cure cancer. It will solve, you know, make all our rivers be clean. It will reduce car emissions, you know, whatever you're doing. If you can say that in a few words, that's good. But the details of technology, that's, you're not going to get that in 15 minutes anyway. So don't, don't dwell on that. And uh, don't try to sell the technology to them. That's not the purpose of this call. Key thing here, listen more than you talk. Your talking should be designed to prompt questions to get you the information that you need to have a better proposal. The goal is not to sell that program manager on your technology that you do in the proposal. At this point, you want to hear what they have to say. One mouth, two ears, you should listen twice the amount that you talk, the ratio holds. Observe the 15 minute limit, if that's what you've stated. A lot of times, if the program manager is engaged, he or she will continue the conversation. And even if they're going, you can say, oh, I see our 15 minutes are about up. Uh, and they'll either say, yes, it's okay to continue. Uh, and that's not a hard and fast deadline. But show respect for their time. And it can be very useful just to end the conversation with an open-ended question. What else should we be keeping in mind? Any other red flags that you can see? So open it up for them. You know, what else, what other guidance can you give me? Because sometimes they will think of something or say something in response to an open ended question that they might not have thought of with all the uh, arguments. The project pitch for NSF, I mentioned before, it's now required, about three pages. Uh, you have to be invited to submit a proposal. Most of them are invited. Uh, right now, the invitation rate is about 90%. Those who apply, they don't have to pick up too many but some of them they do. The form is available online. You can look and see what the questions are. You know, it's like 
500 words describe your technology, 500 words describe your company, 500 words talk about the commercialization. All right, quick pause here. We'll talk about review panels next. It's coming right up. I do have one more question before you get to review panels. All right. Um, this is from the WBDC in Chicago. Are there limitations when you're allowed to interact with the DM? Um, there are for the Department of Defense. Oh, are there limitations? Thank you. Are there limitations when you can respond to the and interact with the PI? And with the Department of Defense, there are. When they come out with a solicitation, they will have about a two month window that you can talk to the PI. And then one month before the solicitation is due, the window closes and you can't talk to them. That's Department of Defense. But it's the only agency that does that. The other agencies don't have a specific time limit. If you're wise though, obviously, you're gonna to wanna to get to them early in the cycle when they're not pressured by who knows how many other people wanting to talk to them as well. You want to get the time where they don't feel less pressured and can give you the kind of information that you're looking for. Some more, if there's not any more questions, we'll go ahead and uh, share some experience from um, Dr. McConnell, who has been on the review panel before. Are there any more questions? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and unmute the mic at Western Illinois University uh, Small Business Development Center. That way, uh, Dr. McConnell can share her experience uh, being on the review panel. All right, and if you could also state what agency you are with, that would be helpful as well. Thank you, Teresa. Oh, hi, can Eric. you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Hi, Teresa. Hi. Okay, cool. Um, Dr. McConnell is here. Hello. Um, I've had some experience with um, serving on review panels for NIH. Um, specifically in biochemistry, molecular biology review panels for SBIR. Um, and so I've done that over a number of years. Um, and I can tell you some of the common uh, issues with um, uh, some proposals that uh, often are caught by review panels and result in lower scores. Um, a review, as a review panel person, um, we get the proposals in advance and uh, we normally do background, look at the um, current state of the technology, literature reviews, and um, information on the PI to uh, make sure that they're qualified um, and have specific techniques. Uh, skills, technical skills, and if that's a problem, that would be brought out initially in the review, uh, but mostly in, after all that's cleared, we uh, look at, you know, basically the idea. Um, there should be, you know, some information about how your idea is better how it differentiates itself from the current technology without going into a lot of technical detail um, so that you get that idea across early in your proposal. Um, there should be, you know, um, the scope should be narrow enough that uh, it's actually doable. A lot of problems I've seen are people try to do too much um, and it, it seems overwhelming, uh, like they would not be able to accomplish those goals. So having um, a narrower scope uh, with a timeline where you can measure your successes and um, have uh, some flexibility in uh, alternate approaches if things don't work out. Uh, with the, the avenue, the approach you're taking is always good because that builds in extra consideration on the reviewers. They see that, that you have some flexibility of alternate approach you could, you could uh, address, um, gives it a higher score generally. I'm sorry I'm a little hoarse because I've been ill, but uh, I'm happy to take questions. Well, one question from here is, could you talk a little bit about the uh, commercialization, the 
the question that was asked earlier, you know, the amount of commercialization review versus the technical review? Well, that depends on the phase. Uh, early phase one, you should have some idea, uh, uh, but minimal uh, about commercialization. And when you get to um, a phase two, then you, you need to be, have a lot more detail about commercialization. Do you have separate commercialization reviewers come in during phase two? Yes. Uh, about at many, NIH. Yeah, how many? At NIH. Um, on the NIH panel, there would be normally 12 to 18 reviewers, but only three are primarily responsible for looking at your application. The others are in the room and hearing and making comments and they score the proposal as well. So they have um, the background in that area or in areas related uh, because normally they cover um, a, a number of different proposals in different areas, uh, like in the molecular biology and biochemistry review panel, we would I would sit on a review panel with maybe a dozen, maybe 15, and I would have um, five or six proposals that I was either primary, secondary, or tertiary reviewer. And as primary, I would have to open up the discussion about it, introduce the proposal, talk about the background of the applicant and what they're trying to do, and a little bit about, you know, the, um, um, my thoughts on the success of the proposal. And then the secondary reviewer would add um, additional comments about what he or she saw on the proposal um, and the tertiary reviewer as well. So they don't introduce the proposal or, or do as much, but they certainly have looked at it. And others in the room may not have, uh, they'll have it up in front of them on a laptop and they'll go through and listen to the comments of the three, three reviewers and look at anything that might be um, uh, pertinent to their experiences and raise questions as well. But they haven't looked at the background or done the literature review and, and had pre-prepared comments before arriving at the review panel session. Definitely. Does that help? Very helpful. And uh, this is Teresa. And I have a question from the uh, Women's Business Development Center in Chicago, and it's specific to NIH proposals. What does it mean when you get in, in parentheses, did not discuss response on your proposal? Well, initially, uh, the primary reviewer and secondary reviewer, or the, well, the, the chair of the session will call for an initial uh, overall vote on the uh, applications of any type of NIH application, whether it be SBIR or others. And if it's so bad that they don't think it has any success, they don't waste a lot of time wanting to review it, uh, they will say uh, that uh, it's uh, non-scored or not uh, below the, the level where it would be considered. So that way they could have more time to discuss the others and those would be not discussed they would be listed as not discussed and that's generally because there's something major wrong with it in terms of um, the um, application itself uh, the background of the pi not having experience, um, resources, something uh, about it that's um, tremendously wrong. And that happens. Any other questions here at the Carbondale? Any questions? No. Nope. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. McConnell. We appreciate your uh, help and insight. And uh, we'll go ahead and keep the mic. Unless you have anything else. 
No, um, I do want to say that uh, if anyone, uh, any of the reviewers during the uh, do not discuss an initial voting uh, saw something in the application worthy of discussing, then uh, even one vote would be, uh, they would open it up for discussion. But there's only three that mainly look at it in detail before the meeting. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. So we'll talk about review panels a little more generally. Um, and this is mostly from NSF experience. I've not been on an NSF review panel, but we've got a lot of reviewers at the University of Illinois who have, so I know what the situation is like there. Usually six or seven people, they're usually split up between technical and business, so they will look at different aspects of your proposal. The important thing for you as a proposal writer is to know that you have to address both of those audiences. They, they're able to find great people. They're able to find leaders in the field. And so you have to, in your proposal, make sure that those leaders are somehow represented in your bibliography. Think through, you know, who's really on top of the arc here. Let's make sure we've got some publications from them in the bibliography. Because those reviewers, when they see the proposal, if they've got publications, what are they gonna do? They'll look, they'll say, oh, am I in the bibliography? And if they don't see themselves, they'll say, oh, this person obviously is not aware of the state of the art, rejected. They like to get diversity, geographical location, uh, like to get women, gender, ethnicity, uh, kinds of diversity. So diversity does show up not as an evaluation criterion, but it is reflected in the panel. They do this for the love of it mostly. They get a modest stipend, like a couple hundred dollars a day or something. It's not that much. Uh, but they do it because they feel an obligation to the research. They've probably been funded by the agency, so feel an obligation to return something to the agency. Uh, they do it to represent their local community. If you're on a panel, you do learn a lot. You can bring that back to your work, so there's a professional development aspect to it. Uh, the agency usually can have a letter of appreciation to the supervisor for tenure-track faculty members, everything else, so that this is another good item to put in their tenure application. But the important thing is that you've got to respect their time and understand the nature of their commitment. They're doing it for the love of it. They're not getting paid to do or put for a small honorarium most of this. They do have to sign a statement of professional ethics saying that they, they aren't collaborators. You know, how, how can you prove that they honor that or not? But they do have to sign it. So at least there's a certain ethical standard they have agreed to obey. They have to sign a statement saying they won't disclose the confidential information and they won't make use of insider information. So if later on you suspect that this has happened, there's a, a potential legal avenue in a paper trail you could sign. This is one of the avenues that the agencies take to protect the integrity of the process and to protect the intellectual property of the customers. Proprietary information itself, um, if your proposal is not funded, no one will ever see it. If your proposal becomes funded, it's a matter of public record, but they are required to remove from the public record the parts of your proposal that are marked as proprietary. So if you mark them ahead of time, you can do that. Abstracts, by the way, are all public domain. You can't put any proprietary information in the abstract. It's all, because the abstracts are available online for most of these agencies, that's public information. Uh, when it comes to uh, marking confidential, it's not gonna work to say, this entire technical work plan is confidential pages one through 12, that's not gonna fly. You have to really get the few areas that are confidential. During the review process, first thing they have is an administrative screen for compliance. Are you longer than or wider margins than an inch? Is your font 10 point size? Do you have information in the margin that's not required? Do you have information in the margin that is required? Some of the agencies require stuff in the margin, others disallow it. So they do that administrative screen, kick it back, never even review it if that's the case. Uh, as Dr. McConnell pointed out, there's an individual initial review with a preliminary score. That individual reviewer will brief the others when he or she uh, has the opportunity to do so. And then initially, all the proposals are ranked into one of three buckets. There's a funded, if at all possible, this, this is a really good one. Fund, if possible, that means we want to fund it, but we're not so sure about, and then do not fund. 
And you usually get a, a few that are the top bucket. You get two thirds or so in the middle bucket and the other third quarter in the bottom bucket. So you want to at least make sure that you're in the middle bucket, fund it at all, fund it possible. And then during the review panel, they collect notes for the debrief and for the information that you get uh, later on. Reasons that they're not funded, a lot of these we've gone over. If it's fitting some of the red flags that we talked about earlier on, if it's a research project that won't get funded, if it doesn't require too much uh, work that won't get funded, they want something that requires a lot of work. If it's not going to succeed commercially, either the product idea or the company itself, that's not going to work. If you don't have much insight into the commercialization landscape, that's not going to work. Overly ambitious is a common problem. Uh, work outside the U.S. is not allowed. That comes up sometimes, and sometimes the proposals are disallowed for that reason. All right, end of this sub-segment, part two. Any questions or discussions on this one? Uh, nothing from the webinars. Okay, uh, the next one is, is all but the last bullet. So let's take five minute breaks, stand up, stretch your legs, and we'll come back here in about five minutes or so and then continue. Thank you. All right, this is uh, where we get into the nitty gritty of the proposal, some more details about what will really make it competitive. We'll look at the different sections and I'll talk a little bit about what makes each section competitive. This necessarily is still somewhat high level because beyond this, you know, what you're doing with your particular proposal is very idiosyncratic and it's hard to say in general how to make your proposal competitive. But these are a broad overview of the very of the different sections of the proposal. Overall, though, basic requirements to keep in mind. Oh, and by the way, notice subtle little thing. These are checklist items here. I've got them listed as a checklist. So you can use this as a checklist as you work through your proposal and as you get to the final stages, go back and review these slides, print them out and run the checklist to make sure you've thought through all of these different areas. You have to read and follow the guidelines carefully. And quite often the guidelines are two documents. That catches you by surprise. The solicitation I mentioned is a request for proposals. It says we're accepting them. It talks about the organization uh, and what you need to apply in general. But then to know all the details about what to put in each form of grants.gov or whatever form that they have, you have a second document that's an application guidelines or grant proposal guide if it's NSF. Uh, so quite often you have to look beyond the first guideline to find the real answer to the font, the page pagination, the margination, all that level of requirement. It's in a second document, so you need to know two documents here. NIH's document is uh, called the Application Guidelines, SDIR, STDI Application Guidelines. And on page 87 of the guidelines, PDF page 87, is about one paragraph, maybe two, that talks about the meat of the proposal. It says, here's what you really have to put in the six pages that constitute your research plan page 87 before you finally get to what really the bulk of the meat of the proposal is. So you've got to read through these in order to understand them carefully and know which sections apply to you. Format, font, page length, easy way for an agency to kick out a proposal. They've got electronic tools that look at the mar margins. I know because I've seen them rejected. It's not an inch long, except NIH allows you a half inch margin. All the others are one inch margin if the font is not right. If the spacing is not right, the Department of Transportation requires one and a half spacing. Department of Education requires double spacing. Everybody else allows single spacing. You have to pay attention to all these really picky you details because it's very easy to, uh, to get rejected. Less picky you, uh, observe the budget limits. Don't go over the budget limits. Read carefully. Sometimes if you're getting additional Technical and Business Assistance, TABA is the buzzword acronym. If you're getting additional TABA, sometimes you can add that on to the value of your proposal and you can actually get more in the value. Sometimes TABA has to be included in the proposal. It depends on the agency and the agency may change from one solicitation to the next. So these are the details you have to pay close attention to. Ancillary documents, you all the time have budgets and letters of support and other uh, bio sketches, current and pending support lists. A conflict of interest list, lots of ancillary documents. Make sure they're all in the correct format. Each agency will have its own specific biosketch format. 
NSF has a four-page format, or NSF has NSF has a two-page format, NIH has a five-page format. So you have to understand the agency discrepancies and make sure you abide by them with all these ancillary documents. If we mentioned proprietary data, you might want to make sure that is marked. Conflicts of interest we've talked about, make sure that they're taken care of. And the guidelines usually have checklists as well. Make sure that you pay attention to those checklists and the guidelines. Make sure that you've covered all the bases there. So as fundamental as this is, this is onerous, it's time consuming, but it's something you have to pay great attention to or your proposal will get kicked out right away because it doesn't meet these basic picky little formatting guidelines. I had an English teacher when I was a sophomore in high school that was like this. She, she required that you, when right, you know, touch, touch the right margin with the beginning of each stroke on the line. The right hand margin was no more than the left margin and no less than half of the left margin. Picky you stuff. And, you know, I hated it at the time, but right now I can see the value of that because it applies to grant writing. It's like my sophomore English teacher. All right. Logical flow overall for the whole document. And this you have to keep in mind as you're working on each little section. First of all, you're appealing to two audiences. You're appealing to a commercial audience and you're appealing to a technical audience. So you have to appeal to both of those. You need to have a top-down flow. Those of you who are used to academic articles, you know how to write a summary at the top and a conclusion at the bottom. And the logical flow is that you present all kinds of data through the whole entire argument that leads inexorably to the conclusion that you have at the end. And so that assuming people have read all the stuff ahead of time, the conclusion proves itself just undeniably. Well, you don't want to do that with one of these proposals. You have to put the conclusion at the top, the big picture at the top. Here's what we will do. Here's the conclusion. Here's what we will accomplish. Here's why this is so important. Here's why you need to pay attention to it. And then you support that. Well, uh, with stages lower down, you support those main arguments. But it's a top-down approach, main points, and then support it. And you have to make it easy for reviewers so that those main points pop, pop out. If you've got a 12-page proposal and it's full of text and no pictures and no bullet points and just page after page of the text, that's hard to read. You don't want to force the reviewer to have to read through all the text in order to pull out your main points. You don't want to bury any main points in subheadings here and there. They have to pop out. Remember, your reviewer will get maybe 10 proposals, something along that line. Your reviewers will see proposals that are 50 pages in length by the time you get the proposal and all the ancillary documents. 10 times 50, one ream of paper, 500 pages. Your reviewers are going to read this on the airplane, maybe the night before the reviewing session, most of them. The main reviewers will read it a little bit ahead of time. But you've got to compete with a ring's worth of other proposals in order to gain attention. The goal that you want, the reaction that you want is that they say, oh, I get it. And they get that right away, within a few seconds. They say, oh, this is neat. I want to read more. This is important. This could solve a problem. I better look into this. And they will form those impressions very quickly. So you have to very quickly make a positive impression with the top-down kind of approach. Overall logical flow, point number one, there's a strong need for the proposal. So you have to identify this need and support it. Here is why we think there's such a strong need. And the strong need usually flows into a commercialization plan section for phase two proposals or a background and significance section. Most of the agencies will have proposals with these kinds of names in their main section. So that's got to be up front. Here's why it's important. No technical detail yet, but here's why it's important. Here are the problems that we're solving. Then you introduce, you say, our technology can solve this problem in a unique way. It can solve this problem if we can prove that it does A, B, and C. A, B, and C will become your technical goals later on. But note how item number two here is a direct result from and feeds into item number one. The need is important. Number two, we can solve that need, and here's how. Then you say, but our technology is too risky for venture capital money at this time. It's too, too risky to put on the market. So we need to de-risk it, and that's what we're going to do in phase one. 
And then you talk technically, finally, you get around to a technical plan. Here's how we're going to make it happen. So need first, what your technology can do to meet that need, how you're going to prove that your technology can meet that need. As obvious as this seems, it's very easy to lose track of this when you get down into the weeds of the proposal. It's very easy if you've got two or three people working on it, have one group going off and doing the commercialization plan, and another group going off and doing the technical plan, and then they don't match up, they miss the mark. The technical plan addresses goals something other than what you've demonstrated are the commercialization goals early on. So throughout the whole proposal development process, you can't lose track of this overall flow. That's why the case statement, I think, is important, because it'll help keep you on track with that overall logic flow. And then finally, here's how we're going to prove that it works. Here's what we will actually do. Here are the goals that we will meet. Here are the techniques that we're going to use. Here are the specifications that we have. Here's how we're going to prove that the technology is feasible. We start out with an abstract and summary. And abstract and summary, my advice, write early, write often. You know, as you start out, the work, write the abstract and summary up front, as if the proposal were done. We're done. Imagine what that abstract would look like. And as you get to work on the proposal itself, you'll go back and revisit that. You'll say, wait, you know, we said this in the abstract, but that's really more than we're going to be able to do. We better cut back on what we say we're going to do. Or, you know, our focus really isn't exactly that. It's really something else. We better revise the abstract. The truly mature proposals are the ones who have this refinement ongoing throughout the whole period of proposal development. Early on, generate enthusiasm. Why should we care? Why is this solving an important problem? Get the hooks into the reviewer. Early on, beware of buzzwords and heavy technical jargon. You don't want to make people, especially the commercial reviewers, they're not going to understand that. They sound like buzzwords. It will go blah, 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 blah in their mind. So you need to write very clear, very simple, simple words. A good test when you write your abstract Give it to a middle school student. Give it to a high school freshman. Ask them to read it and ask them to tell you what it said and see if they get it. And if they don't get it, you probably need to rework it. Now, your reviewers are at a much higher level than that. But remember what you're competing against. So you've got to write at a level so that a junior high or high school student could understand the abstract. They were technologically knowledgeable. That's kind of the level that you target. Later on, you go through all the details. But to get the hooks in, that's what you do up front. Commercialization plan. Um, critical section. In phase two proposals, sometimes the commercialization plan is of equal length to the actual technical plan. In phase one proposal, it depends on the agency. The amount of time on an NSF proposal that you spend with uh, commercialization is about half the proposal. The amount of technical is about half the proposal. With NIH, you've got a couple sentences of commercialization you have to squeeze into your six pages of NIH proposal. So they don't expect a lot of commercialization phase one in NIH. You want to show them that you thought about it. In phase two for NIH, you do a whole other 12 page commercialization program, but not for phase one. So you've got to demonstrate the value to the customer, not the value that you think will be to the customer, but the value that the customer has actually told you because you've been out there talking to them. You've done some customer discovery. You've got some market experience. It's important for the voice of the customer to speak. That weighs volumes in terms of the commercialization plan. If somehow you represent, we went and talked to the company, we talked to 100 different customers, and where we thought we were going to have a market, in this little niche, we discovered that there really wasn't a market there, so we pivoted. We're addressing a slightly different market because that's what our customer base has told us they want to have, that's very strong. The voice of the customer, quotes from the customer is good. Letters of support are very important, as I mentioned. They represent the voice of the customer. But not just the voice of the customer, but knowledge of the ecosystem. How do you get the product out there? Are you going to put it on the web and sell it yourself? What makes you think that you're going to compete against all the billions of other, millions of other website people who are out there selling stuff? Are you going to get this on the self at Lowe's Hardware? What makes you think you can get into Lowe's Hardware? Are you going to get this medicine in the hands of doctors? Well, to get in the hands of doctors, it's got to have regulatory approval. It has to be a distributor. Are you going to get the doctors aware of it? There's a limit to what the distributors can advertise now. Uh, you're not going to put it on TV in all likelihood. How are you going to actually penetrate that market? 
Who are influencers of the decision-making process? Who are the buyers? How do you get the stuff to them? What do they read? What are, uh, articles do they look at? So understanding that marketing ecosystem is very important. And the market assessment is important. Now, it's, it's really helpful to have two levels of market assessment. One is a top-down assessment, which I talked about earlier, but it's not sufficient. And the other is a bottom-up assessment. So I'm going to present now an example of a top-down and one example of a bottom-up. These are examples only, they're not templates. You shouldn't do exactly what I do here. You need to do what makes sense for your market, for your product, and that will differ. Another thing, by the way, which reminds me, reviewers don't like boilerplate. If anything looks like boilerplate, it's a turnoff, but then you haven't thought about it. They want the real truth for your particular project in your particular market. The TAM, SAM, SAM approach is very common. TAM being total available market, and you do some market research, you read some journals. And you say, okay, we're going to develop a widget. And uh, you know, worldwide, we think there's a billion dollar market. And we know that because we've read this marketing report for all widgets. But the serviceable available market is the widgets that are along the lines of what we're producing. Because we're not going to compete with all widgets, we're just going to compete with a specific kind of widget. So, Let's say you estimate that your serviceable, addressable market from your market research is 500 million. Then you can say, but, you know, we're not gonna achieve 100% of that market. No one gets 100% of the market. We're gonna have an attainable amount of something less. So some percentage of that, and we'll say, okay, that's our SOM, serviceable, obtainable market. So this kind of three disc ham, sam, sam approach, very typical um, high level, top down marketing approach. Good to put in your proposal. Reviewers quite, quite often will be familiar with this. They'll be used to it. And so that's not a, not a bad way to establish a top-down kind of look at the marketplace. It shows at least that you thought about it and done some research. But it's not sufficient because it's still an imagined theoretical market that you haven't penetrated yet. You're just imagining maybe you'll get these percentages. A much better way would be a bottom-up approach or an additional way. And I'll show you an example of a bottom-up approach here. I won't go through all the details, but you'll get the idea of how it works. Let's say you're going to have a $200 product that you're going to sell, and that you've sampled 200 different users, and you've, you've learned from the sampling and customer discovery technique that you know, about 2% of them, or about 10% of them, won't even need this at all. So of the 200 available customers, 2% won't need it, 20% of them will really buy it a lot. So 80% of that 20% will actually buy your product. And you do the same thing with the other sectors. So you do some analysis, some review, you come up with percentages of buy. This is a bottom-up estimate here. And based on the sample then, you say, okay, we know what percentages of which populations are going to buy. We know that there are 200,000 users in our market eventually. So if you extrapolate from the 200 in the test, to 200,000 eventual ones, then you can come up with these numerical numbers of how many you think will actually buy, how many units you'd have to sell. And then the reviewer says, well, does that look reasonable? Do you think you'll be able to sell that many units? And you look at it and ask yourself the same questions. Do you think I'll be able to sell this many units? If it's wrong, if it's out of the whack, you need to adjust it. But this kind of a market approach where you build up an estimate from your customer discovery, from your actual base, of users you contacted really strengthens the commercialization section much better than anything else. So build it up from the bottom as well, market assessment. Not only do you need to sell the strength of the product's potential in the marketplace, but you need to sell the strength of the company itself as a long-term viable entity. Remember back to the beginning, what the government wants is long-term viable tax-paying corporations who are making a lot of money and returning a fair share of it to the government for their business. So your, your proposal needs to have a strong team as well as a strong product, a strong idea. If it's just academics, that'll raise some flags. If you can show that you know how to make money, with just some experience on the team that has done some commercialization before, that's good. If you've got a vision for future growth, that can help you. If you talk about one product and then that product has a limited marketplace, and then once you've done that product, what's the next step? Are you a one-trick pony? That's not going to look good. 
So you want to say something like, this is our initial product. Beyond this product, if it's successful in the marketplace, we can envision broadening our expanse to cover other additional neighboring markets. And here's how we'll go about that. So a long-term plan and plan and vision for the future, very important. Are you well positioned in the marketplace with collaborators? And by collaborators, I mean distribution partners, mentors, uh, other people in the industry who are well placed, influencers. Are you really part of the marketplace? Do you understand it? Those collaborations are very good, very helpful. Now, if you're getting started as a startup company, you've got two people and you don't even exist as a company operationally, except on paper, no one is going to expect for you to have all the legal help that you need, all the financial help that you need, all the business experience that you need, all the customer support that you need. No one expects you to have all that in place. But that's okay, as long as you recognize that these are gaps. And you can say in your proposal, we realize our team is very technologically oriented at the moment. However, one of our technological leads is already getting an MBA. However, we are associated with the Dunn Richmond Economic Development Center. We're located here at Southern Illinois University, where there's a wealth of support for young entrepreneurial leads. So point to places where you can fill the gaps. If you say, we're going to run for three years with the technology CEO, and at that point, we're going to actually hire a CEO to come in from the outside with business experience and executive experience to run the company, that's a good set. Show that you're aware of the gaps. It's okay to have them, but if you can show that you're aware of them, that's even better. Letters of support, very important. Key point in letter support is to validate the marketplace. You need to show that there is an actual market out there, that there is a demand for the product. One letter from one customer doesn't do very much, better than nothing. One letter that says, this looks very interesting, does next to nothing. You want to avoid anything that looks like applause from the sideline. Don't have anything that says, this is a great person who really wrote the proposal, high integrity, really high, good worker. That will do you no good at all. You need someone who says, I want this product. And I know a lot of other people that want the product. And for some, some reason, I represent a huge portion of the population. Either I'm a leader in the field and everybody looks at me, or I'm a distributor. And I know because I'm in touch with uh, customers that they would love this product, that there's a man for it. I'm a researcher and I need this in my research. And I also know this would be applicable in another area. And for something to validate the marketplace. So it's not just imagine the real voice of the customer. Stronger letters have stronger letters of uh, stronger notes of commitment in them. If somebody says, we will be watching your work with great interest, that's no commitment. If a letter says, we want to put this in our catalog, we will dedicate a person month's worth of time to advise this business on their marketing efforts during the development to make sure that it fits our needs. That's very strong. If it says we're a partner and we want to adopt this technology and we want to license it, and we will allow this company to come in and use our laboratory at no expense, and we will oversee them at no expense so that we can collaborate on uh, characteristics of performance, features, make sure that it really serves the marketplace, that's strong. Some kind of a letter of commitment. Evidence of a working relationship over time, that's strong. If you go meet someone and, and they're writing their letter, oh, you know, when you stopped by last week, the product looked really interesting. You don't have a relationship with that person over time. But if the letter says, we have been working with this company for three years, and we've got a memorandum of, of agreement and a letter of cooperation in place now, because we want this technology, that kind of commitment, that kind of a relationship over time, very strong. Common question, how many letters to support are allowed? How many should I have? NSF has an answer to that question. It's no more than three in phase one. It's no more than five in phase two. But even at that, quality trumps quantity. Three weak letters are not nearly as good as two strong ones. So you want to get really good letters. And usually it's hard enough to get really good letters that you don't have to worry about getting too many of them. You want to get really good ones. And as I said before, it takes time to develop really good letters. All right, here's some examples. 
you know what they're talking about. Here, here are some examples of weak wording in a letter of support. You say something like, we strongly support your efforts and we'll be watching your progress closely. No commitment, no relationship over time, no impact on the marketplace. After meeting you last week, we are interested in your work. I mentioned this already. There's no relationship shown there. Personal testimony doesn't do anything to validate the marketplace. It doesn't do anything to show the strength of the technology or the company. So let's look at some strong wording examples. Here's an example from a big customer. We will save a million dollars a year if we can get this technology. So we're going to put some technical manpower behind it and make sure that it's successful and it works for us because we want this. A distributor, like I mentioned, our customers want this product. I would love to put it in my catalog. As soon as it's available, I'm going to do that. So I'm going to help with the research and with the customer discovery and marketing to make sure that it's well positioned in the marketplace. Very strong letter. Strong letter from an investor would be, this is in our wheelhouse. This is the type of investment that we make and this is a very strong opportunity. We can say that confidently because it's our area and we are ready to invest in this company, but it's too risky right now. We can't invest in anything that's risky. We need your agency's money to de-risk the technology, at which point we'll jump with the investment. That's the kind of thing you want to put in letters of support. All right, um, I'm going to talk about project objectives next, which is moving from the commercialization section of the proposal into the work plan, plan part of the proposal. We'll only pause now and see if there are any questions from our remote participants or in the room here. Yeah. It's letters. They develop them something and it's not on the market yet. So you're telling them what you're doing. So, how can you protect your invention? How, how do you protect your yes. invention? That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, how do you protect your invention? Well, that's a fine line that you have to walk. Um, you can get a patent on it, even though you have a detail how you're going to make the patent work. So, that's one mechanism. There are a number of different protections that you can put in place. Another is just not to reveal too much about the technical details, how it works. And say, here's what we think this product will be able to do if we can work out the technical details, but you don't reveal what the technical details are. That's got limited uh, uh, protection because a big company with a big lab will go figure out how to do it themselves and then they'll, they'll compete with you. You can put a memorandum of agreement with uh, background IP and licensing protection in place if you get that far. The big companies are concerned about this too, by the way. When I was in Boston in June, I listened to several big companies who said, you know, when someone comes to us with an idea, we have to be very careful that they don't tell us too much. That we tell them not to tell us too much until we've got an agreement in place. Because we don't want to be subject to lawsuits either. And if we go out and develop technology that they approach us about, even if we're developing on our own and they've approached us about it, we might look like uh, we're stealing their ideas. So we've got to put those protections in place. Usually, if that's a concern with a company that you're working with, you can address that specifically. You can say up front, we are working in this area. We're developing a technology that we think would be of interest to you. You might be a collaborator. You might be a competitor. This happens a lot where you can't tell if the person's going to be a collaborator or a competitor up front. But we want to protect our IP. How do you go about doing that? What would you recommend? You're the big company, you've got experience. We haven't even started yet, really. How would you get a letter? How would you get a letter? Yeah. Well, if if the relationship <coughs> proceeds far enough along that you're comfortable working with them, they will give you a letter, probably. If the relationship doesn't get that far, that you feel comfortable asking them for a letter, you ask a letter for somebody else. And again, I can't say for every situation what the rule is. I can just talk in general about the kinds of things you can do. Your situation may be a little different. I don't know. But it is something you have to tread lightly. You have to tread carefully. You have to watch yourself. And, but it is something that you can deal with directly and explicitly with the company and work on that ahead of time so that you both feel comfortable working together. And if you don't, you don't get a letter from it. You get a letter from somebody else. Three. Could you ask them to sign a non-disclosure agreement? That's another protection, yep. 
very common one, very good one. So another protection is signing a non-disclosure agreement. Okay, the question was, can you sign another non uh, uh, can you sign a non-disclosure agreement? The answer is yes, that's a good approach. Very common. In fact, a lot of times that's one of the earliest things that you do when you're working with a company, is you sign a mutual non-disclosure agreement. And the company has to protect its information as well because you will learn something about what they're doing that they might not want made available to the public. We do have one more question. If that's All okay. right, yeah, sure. Uh, what is the balance between having a proof of a concept to show that to your potential customers to get feedback to layers of support versus being too far along uh, during phase one of funding? Yeah, without knowing the specific, well, the question is, what is the balance of having a proof of concept far enough along to show to a customer, but is it, if, if, if you have it that far along, is it too far along for funding? It's just something you have to be aware of. Um, you want to hit that sweet spot that I talked about. Maybe you don't have a proof of concept yet. Maybe your proof of concept is a drawing. Maybe your proof of concept is a non-working mock prototype that you've knocked out on a 3D printer. And they can hold it, but it can't work yet. You know, you have to kind of decide for your particular industry, for your particular application, what is appropriate. I know that's not a very hard targeted answer, but it really does depend on the situation. All right, let's move forward to some other section. The project objectives. Um, these were worth a lot of time because the project objectives are a summary of your technical work plan. This is where you state the A, B, and C that's going to de-risk the technology, the A, B, and C that's going to prove that this, this product is feasible, that it could work. You don't want too many objectives. You don't want to overreach. Three to six, any more than six, you're diluting your effort in a phase one proposal. Three to four is a good number. They need to show the innovation, technical risk. They need to be linked to the marketing technology need, commonly overlooked, but they've got to do the things that you set up front would need to be done in order to demonstrate commercial viability. They need to be pitched so that when you achieve them, you're positioned for phase two funding. And then you can go and say, okay, we've done what we said we were going to do in phase one, so give us the money for phase two. Those 50% of the people who don't get funded for phase two, to go back to the earlier question, are the ones who really haven't successfully demonstrated in phase one that they've done those things and probably haven't even worded the objectives well enough so that it's clear whether or not that they've, that they've done them. You won't want to avoid words in your objectives like, we will study, we will research, we will characterize. Well, unless you're NIH, NIH will let you characterize things. That means something in the, the biology world. But these generic terms, you know, we will review literature. So that's not going to get you any place. You can go read a book and you've done it and you're done with the phase one proposal, but you won't get funded for phase two. You want very clear, measurable objectives with success criteria. Here's exactly what we're going to do. And the uh, mnemonic, one handy one is SMART, S-M-A-R-T. The goals need to be specific. You've got to say exactly what the product will do under what criteria, to which specifications. You have to be measurable. And then you will say in your research plan how you're going to go about doing the measurement. They've got to be something you can actually achieve, so attainable goals. They need to be relevant to the task at hand and time-based. Now, your time base is at the end of phase one. Or phase two, it's a phase two proposal. You still have technical objectives. So this is a good mnemonic to keep in mind, S-M-A-R-T. All right, we can look at a few examples here, some weak project objectives, examples, results. Well, for one thing, this is passive voice. Results from potential customers will be used to help determine which features are most important. If you don't know this, you're not going to be funded. You're not ready to submit yet. We will begin by collecting data on current agronomic best practices by validating several unknown technical specifications. Again, you don't know what you're talking about here. This is too big to have any meaning. We will characterize the feasibility of a multi-sensor integration platform. You know, what does that mean? You're not really saying exactly what you're gonna do here. So these are weak objectives. You can't measure them. You can't prove that you've done that. You're not setting yourself up for phase two 
if you've got generic ones like this, some strong objectives by contrast, we will develop a single unit prototype that transfers one kilowatt power to location a thousand miles away with loss of 0.15 kilowatts using components with a total cost of less than a thousand dollars. If you do this, it's very easy to show that you've done this or not. Either you've done it or not. So you can write, this is a, a good objective. You can prove that it's done, it's precise. If you're able to do this, you'll have proven that the technology is feasible and worthy of phase two support. Same kind of thing with these other two. I won't read them here, but you can see they're specific, they're measurable, they include criteria. Sometimes it aren't technical criteria. Sometimes it has to be within a certain cost. Sometimes it has to be constrained by time, but you have various specifications and constraints that you have to meet with those. Then you've got a successful proposal. All right, the technical objectives flows right into your work plan. And I feel a little guilty here because I've got one slide on the work plan where really it's half your proposal or in some cases even more. But this is the technical nitty gritty that we don't really need to go over today. The important thing here, again, keep the linkage clear so that it's clear which tasks that you have are feeding into which objectives. A lot of times it's handy if your project falls out this way to say objective number one, task one, task two, task three, objective number two, task one, task two, task three. Step by step how you do that. Here it's okay to have dense diagrams. Here it's okay to use technical jargon. Here's where you really strut your stuff in terms of a technology entrepreneur. You really know your field. Go ahead, have at it. Have references to what else is going on in the field. Be as dense and as thick as you want because this is where the technical people will be scrutinized to your effort. It has to be a workable plan. It has to be attainable. So you have to say which analytical tools you will use. What statistical approaches you'll use to validate whatever statistics you're coming up with. This is a risky proposal. All SPIRs have a high element of risk. That means things can go wrong. So what's your risk mitigation plan? That you need to build into the technical support. If our envisioned approach A doesn't work, we will try envision B. If B doesn't work, we will try C. Here are alternatives. Here are what we are aware of the risks. Here's how we're gonna mitigate those with the alternatives. This is how we're gonna approach that. So you demonstrate awareness of risk and you provide a mitigation plan. And anticipate technical objections. If you were reading through this your first time as an NSF high-level reviewer, what would you find wrong with it? Almost every research plan has some holes in it. A good research paper will say, here are the limitations of this piece of research. You wanna do the same kind of thing here. Here are the limitations of our approach, we're aware of it. Or here are the limitations of the approach and you find that out a month ahead of time and say, oh, well we can address this. Let's go think about it. Let's spend another week and answer that question. Build the answers into the proposal. All right, formatting, the last major section here. Now here in formatting is where you can compete with that ream of paper. Here's where you can make your proposal stand out, folks. The goal is at a glance comprehension. So if it's scanning, a reviewer can see what it's all about. Scanning, a reviewer can get the idea. Scanning, a reviewer can say, I want to read more. This is important. This is going to do some neat things. I'm going to pick the sections that mean the most to me, and I'm going to read those in depth. If I'm a commercial reviewer, I'm going to read through the commercialization plan. If I'm a technical reviewer, I'm going to look at that work plan and see if they really can accomplish what they say they're going to accomplish. So to do the at a glance comprehension, bullet numbers, you know, bullet lists, numbered lists, those are very strong, so include that. Bolding, make bold points stand out. A lot of times you can't pull out a main point into a bullet point list. It has to have some context within a paragraph, which you can highlight. You can bold the main point so that it stands out so that someone can scan and read it. If you pick up a magazine, Time Magazine, People Magazine, even Scientific American, National Geographic, what do you see? You see graphics, always. You see bulleted lists, you see several points of entry for the eye. You do see multiple columns, which you're not allowed to do in these proposals. But you see a lot of ways to gain attention quickly. So journalism is really good at capturing your attention at a glance. And you can look at a page and say, I like it. Or you can say, I don't turn the next page. 
So look at a magazine, see what they do. A lot of quotes here and there. You adopt some of those techniques to make your proposal as readable as others. Here's a key that's often overlooked. Every main subheading that you, every main heading section of the proposal has to be exactly what it says in the guidelines. And that's a proposal, five sections. Elevator pictures first, innovation second. So your proposal has to have section one, innovation, section or section one, elevator pitch, section two, innovation. Has to be exactly what's in the proposal. But beneath that, you can have subheads. And you can build summary content into the subheads. There's a, a weak one. If you say extent of problem as a subhead, that communicates to the reviewer that they will have to read more. And if they spend the time to read more, they will learn the extent of the problem. But if the subhead somehow crystallizes and encapsulates that problem, that tells the reviewer, here's the problem. You don't have to read more to get the main point of it. Here's the example I give here. $116 of billion dollars a year, US crop loss to heat stress. This is a big problem. They can see what the problem is just by scanning the headers. So build that content into the headers. Graphics are critical, and graphics can take a long time to make a really good one. Here again, up front, the goal is at, at a glance comprehension. So you don't want to put your technical graphs with lots of blobs and wavy lines and dense charts and, and a caption that's as long as the text itself to explain it. You don't want to force anybody to read that. Up front, the graphic really isn't worth a thousand words. You might question whether to put it in. It's got to convey quickly a few main things. It has to convey the value of your innovation. It has to convey the nature of the technical innovation. And it has to say a little bit about what it's like to use the in innovation. What's the user experience like? And capturing all those in a single graphic, very difficult to do, non-trivial. If you do it really well, and it'll take a month or two to do this with several iterations, you come up with a graphic that you go, oh, well, that's obvious. That's what you want. An obvious graphic that looks so obvious, no one realizes how long it took to put it together. These graphics take a long time to do, and they're not easy to do to convey all those things in a single graphic. Usually you have to have trade-offs. You have to emphasize the user experience. You have to emphasize the graphics, the nature of the technology. You have to emphasize uh, the value proposition. And you don't want to make reviewers guess about the meaning of graphics. You also want to have a current level of professional polish. And the graphics that everybody sees nowadays have a certain amount of professional polish to them. Find the graphics to use PowerPoint, use some mechanisms to come up with some level of professional polish in your graphics. And so we will play a game now. We've got time to do this. We're going to play a game called the graphics guessing game. And this is a game you want to keep your reviewers from playing. So let me get up the graphics guessing game. And we'll play the game that you don't want to make your reviewers play. What I'm going to do here is I'll present to you graphics that very much approximate real life graphics that I've seen in real time but are genericized enough so that you can't tell who they are. Because I also have to protect the uh, confidentiality of the clients that I do. Remember what the graphics have to show. Essence of the technology, value proposition of the buyer, user experience. All right, so unless you have a graphic that shows that information clearly within the graphic, you're making the reviewers play the graphic guessing game. So let's look at this, I've got five of these graphics. We won't spend a lot of time on them, but what is this? Untitled number one, what is, what, if you're a reviewer and you look at this, what is it? Petri dish. Petri dish, okay, it looks like a petri dish. So you get a sense this is probably a biology related proposal. All right, yeah, yeah. Any other guesses what this is? Sorting. Sorting, yeah, there's some kind of sorting involved there. Which area of biology, what it's actually doing, not there. So here's an improved graphic. This improved graphic shows you that the technology is actually a, a gene splicing technology where you create a GMO plant that reflects 
infrared signals differently and if it's stressed or not. You, you build the plant, you construct it with a gene splicing technique, you apply a drone over it, and then you pounce it with infrared rays, it sends back IR signals if it's stressed. And that goes to a data system that you can then analyze, and so you instantly know, just with a drone flyover, whether this plant is, plant is stressed. Well, that's a neat technology. And if you look at this graph here, this picture, ah, yes, I can see that. I can glance it over. I can see how this works. I can see that this has value. This doesn't talk about user experience, but you do understand the nature of the technology. All right, number two, what is this? What's the value proposition here? And I have seen these in proposals up front. Here's the graphic, here's, here's what we're doing. Yeah, you can't tell, you can't tell. Already it's problematic because why do you have two representations, representations of the same molecule? You've got the Lewis dot structure, you've got the molecular modeling for the same thing, it's duplicative, you don't learn anything one from the other. This is a molecule called Roxarzone, which is a, a component used in poultry production. It's a food additive for poultry production. And so with this artificially produced food additive, it can be produced in plants. You don't need to grow food additive, you can make it biologically. Uh, and then you can ship it to the poultry farm for better chickens. And that shipping is inexpensive because it's just powder that you make. So once again, this graphic shows you the value proposition. At a glance, you say, oh yeah, I kind of get this idea here. You don't see the user experience, but you do get an idea of what's involved. And number three, what do you suppose this is? Say, you got a guess? Gel electrophoresis. Oh, pardon? Gel electrophoresis. Gel electric, all right. Well, electric is right. This is actually a battery. This is the components of a battery. And this battery reduces power and weight from your standard battery. So what's the value proposition? Well, this was a proposal for the Department of Defense. They wanted lighter weight batteries for field trips because the users who are weighed down with all kinds of paraphernalia anyway, have to carry a lot of battery weight to power all the electronics in the battery pack. So here, at a glance, you can quickly see, okay, for a one through five day field trip, at the bottom is how much battery power you need now. And you can't take a five day field trip now. You'd need more battery pack power than you can get into your backpack. But the top, with the proposed technology, you would have room for other material with their proposed battery. So the value is immediately obvious. Number four, crop field, very good. Illinoisians are very good at getting this graphic. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows it's a crop field. Uh, some people know that it's a stressed crop field because you see the red, so that means it's stressed somehow. Well, this is a technology that, um, that detects stress via drones, kind of similar to the, chick to the, to the first one. But this graphic here um, emphasizes the user experience. So this is kind of what it's like to use it. It doesn't show the value of the technology too much, but you get the user experience. All right, final one. Who knows what this is? I've seen these. I've seen these in proposals. Yeah, I couldn't tell either. <laughs> There's no way of telling. Well, you know, PDCA, if you've read a lot of uh, project management material, you'll know that's plan, development, check, and act. So that's a common cycle. This is actually a uh, software tool that allows electronic prototyping uh, for, for devices so that you can run processes faster. And here's the improved graphic where Without the product, you have to do this PDCA type of, maybe it takes two years for typical software development. They can reduce that cycle time to four months. So you can have six PDCA cycle, uh, cycles in the span of two. All right, so humorous way of showing the game, but don't make the reviewers play the graphics guessing game. Give the information that conveys 
the value of the product, the user experience, the nature of the technology. All right, uh, questions quickly, and then we'll go to the last one, but any questions so far on this part? All right, let me bring up the next session then. All right, so you just got a new SBI award, congratulations. That means you got to structure your company to respond to the award, to meet all the requirements of the award, or sometimes it means you have to create the company if it existed only on paper before. It takes a team of people to do this. So you're gonna to have to arrange for workers in a lot of different areas. For one, you will need people to do the work, the technical work of itself. You'll need to hire those people. And you'll need a place for them to work. And they'll need equipment to work on. So you have a whole area of technical operations to deal with. By the way, I'm going to overview of a few of these areas, but I'm only gonna talk in detail about one. But this just gives you the, a mate, the idea of the nature of things you have to keep in mind. You need to have executive and administrative capacity in place. Somebody's got to make decisions about the company. Somebody has to run things. So you need that executive capability. You'll need some kind of legal resource. Legal counsel is good. That's a typical avenue, but you need to identify a legal person or people that you trust or firm. You'll need a whole lot of collaborators. Sometimes they're written in the proposal, sometimes they aren't. If you've got a sub-award or a contractor, you'll need that person. Consultants, you'll need those people. But you'll also have informal business mentors. Here in Doug Richmond, you've got a nice collaborative network built in for you. That's great. Uh, wider in the marketplace, it's good to have collaborators who are out there in the marketplace, distributors, other people that you can go to. So all kinds of collaborators. Uh, obviously, you need to have customers. You don't have customers right off the bat but you need to be developing them right off the bat. And dealing with customers means that you'll have customer support issues. It means you'll have marketing customer discovery areas to work on. It means you have fulfillment issues. So you have to have a whole area of customer development and customer support. You don't even have a host of others. There are always some, something else that's not covered in one of these fields where it's good to have somebody that, you know, maybe it's a family member for moral support. You know, you'll need other people as well as these official ones. And the part that I'm going to talk about, finance, payroll, administration. You need a financial system that can respond to the needs of the proposal. And so you will need to put a lot of systems in place. Now, if you don't put these systems into place, you could be facing problems. Unless you put these in place, you could maybe not get future awards. If you're not tracking time and expenses carefully, you might have to return money to the government. I have seen it happen more than once. You could be subject to legal actions and fines if you're not meeting all the requirements of the proposal. You could be barred from future awards. The horror list goes on and on. So you want to get this in place to keep your company in good standing. Where it really shows up is when you get the notice of potential to receive an award, then you fill out a financial questionnaire. So it shows up then. It doesn't show up for the first several months of the award. You could probably do most of phase one without having the system in place. But then when you want to do phase two, you're not really strong enough to do phase two. You won't succeed with the financial questionnaire. If you want to do a follow-on proposal, you need to have a strong financial base to justify your expenses, justify your indirect rates. You need it for closeout at the end of the proposal. You need it for audits. So you have to have all these systems in place at these key points in the process. 
So let's take out a notebook here and kind of keep track of the, the main aspects, the main systems that you need to put in place. You'll need a job cost accounting system. Your financial system will have to have every transaction associated with the company recorded, and every one of those transactions has to be associated with some job. If you've got a contract with the government, then the work direct on that contract has to be associated with that contract. The work that's not on that contract, if it's an indirect expense, that has to be associated with indirect expenses. All your expenses have to be associated with one or more jobs. If you're working, you have to have a contracting system to prove that the time that you're putting in is going to the right places. And not only do you have to track the time that you spend on something, but you have to track the results of what you actually do. So you need some kind of work track. And reporting system. Doesn't need to be elaborate, doesn't need to be fancy, and you'll need written documentation for policies and procedures. This is commonly overlooked. Quite often, companies will get up and running, small group, they all know how things work, so they don't write down how things work. But then when you do an audit or when you do the financial award questionnaire for phase two, there's a question do you have written policies and procedures to support the way that you do things? You want to be able to check yes on that box. We've got this all written down. And you need to track contract requirements. Contracts come with lots of requirements beyond the deliverables. The deliverables are obviously very important, but there may be contracts for, um, and there may be requirements for uh, ethical training. National Science Foundation says if you've got a student working on your proposal, they'll have to have proof of ethical conduct and research training. You don't submit it to them, but you keep it handy. But they'll have to have that training. So, each contract, each agency will have a set of requirements. You have to make sure that you're meeting all of those requirements. So let's look at the items on this checklist now. We've got five of them. Job cost accounting. As I mentioned, it means all costs are associated with one specific cost objective. And this really does matter. This is important for business. You need, at the end of the proposal, to be able to prove that you've spent the money that you said you spent. And unless you're tracking where the money goes and associated with that project, you won't be able to prove that. And you need to support your indirect cost calculations. Remember early on, I mentioned the indirect costs. Uh, if you want to be able to justify an indirect cost rate so that you know you're getting compensation for your indirect costs as well as your direct costs, you need to have a basis for that. And that needs to be in the accounting and financial system. So there's an example of what it looks like. Direct costs have to be segregated from indirect costs. Or you won't be able to calculate that rate. Here's a little copy of the slide I did earlier. Labor costs all have to be segregated by job, as well as all the other costs. And to segregate labor costs, you do that with a time tracking system. The time tracking system has to be rigorous. This is probably the biggest hang up of most of the companies that I work with when I set them up and get them going for an award. They don't have a time tracking system, they're not used to tracking time, they're students, they're faculty members. Why do they have to track time? Well, suddenly you do have to track time. This is a government requirement. And you need a system in place to do that. It can be paper-based, it can be electronic. You just have to set it up. It should be have a written set of policies to go along with it. You should be very clear what you're doing. You have to track it constantly. People have to submit time. People should fill out the time sheet every day. You have to record all the hours you work not just a percentage. You can't say, oh, last month I worked half on this project, half on that project. That's not sufficient. It's not strong enough time track. If you work on a holiday and you're on a 50% appointment, then you have to write down four hours of work spent on that holiday. So holiday time, personal time off, vacation time, all has to be reported as well. If you work on a Saturday, you record that. If you work seven hours instead of eight hours one day, you record seven hours. During an audit, if somebody looks at an, if the auditor looks at a sheet and it says eight hours a day, Monday through Friday, and no time on weekends for a startup entrepreneurship company, that's going to look suspicious. Because nobody really works exactly eight hours a day on a startup effort, Monday through Friday. So it has to be real. It has to reflect what's really going on. <laughs> and that time tracking system somehow has to interface with the payroll system because the payroll system is where it calculates the value of that time. If you work 50% on administrative and 50% on direct, then that will translate to some dollar value. 
your accounting system. So it'll be 50% one, 50% um, the other. That information has to make its way back to the accounting system. It's got to be linked. I mentioned could be paper based, could be electronic, should be written policies and procedures. You need to track the work itself. Um, provide all the deliverables. That's obvious. Deliverables are usually pretty easy to track. There aren't that many of them. For SBIR, almost always the deliverable is a report. Rarely do you actually deliver the product. Rarely do you actually deliver a prototype. The deliverable, even for the Department of Defense, is almost always a report. A report. But uh, there are formal reporting requirements, sometimes as often as a month, but that's rare. Usually with a phase one proposal, it's a final report. That won't satisfy your project manager. Project managers usually like to be kept apprised of a project status more often than a year later after they got funding. And you have to find out from your project manager what the preference is. If the manager wants to hear things once a month informally via email, you do that. If the manager wants to hear nothing except when there's a major change, you do that. Whatever they want, whatever they formula. If, if they tell you, well, you know, when you reach a major, mile, major milestone, let me know. You won't hear back from me, but let me know. Then you have to do that and not expect to hear back from them. And I hear that from NSF people a lot. We like to know when the major milestones occur, but you might not hear back from us. But you're busy. Main, main point here, too. You got consultants and subcontractors, you need to get work product from them. And sometimes this can be tricky. If you have a consultant who comes in and advises on a process and you refine your process according to that advice, what do you have to show as a work product? Uh, the, the product ended up being part of the procedure, but they really didn't write it down. So there, whenever they do the work, keep a log of it. If they advise on process, you say, okay, consultant was here for two days, and here are the areas that he or she advised on. So a lot of it. Uh, quite often you can ask consultants to provide an invoice that describes the nature of their work. And the invoice can serve as work product. So it's important to get that information from the consultants, from the subcontractors. That's often overlooked. Policies and procedures in all these different areas, write them down. They don't have to be elaborate. They don't have to be extensive. It doesn't have to be pages and pages. A few pages is fine for these. They should be accurate. They should reflect reality, how you really do things. But make sure you write them down. It's good for business, too, not just for auditing, but as good business practices is something you want to do. And lastly, the contract requirements management system. As I mentioned, a lot of times requirements go beyond the deliverables that are listed in the contract. And so even if you get the notice of award, it won't list all the deliverables, all the requirements. It'll point to other documents that have terms and conditions. Um, so you have to read those other terms and conditions and make sure that you're covered in all the areas that are important. There's a lot of work spent reading through terms and conditions when you get the contract. It's pages and pages. This read probably isn't enough to represent the terms and conditions you have to read. And whenever you read one, You've got to make sure that you can prove that you've met that condition. So you have to put a plan in place with a procedure that's documented that shows that you've met that condition. All right, high level, blow through, quick ones here. We have a few minutes left. Can I answer any final questions? Entertain any final uh, input from anybody? All right, uh, time for a lunch break then, and uh, I will be available for the one-on-one -on -one sessions and just inform you someone can chat. Thank you. Thank you. That was excellent. Thank you so much, Roland. Pleasure. I uh, just want to take a few minutes for, for a few brief thank yous, and then we'll talk about how the afternoon will go for those of you who are staying for those one-on-one -on -one sessions. So thank yous, uh, Sherry, Illinois University Incubator Network, and from New York University of Illinois. Um, certainly a lot of uh, 
work went into planning and organizing and coordinating and all the materials and all of that. And so Sherry did some great work there. So thank you for all of that. Um, Illinois PTAC at Western Illinois University and Teresa, um, also a big help in coordinating all of these efforts, doing some test runs with our host sites and uh, getting all of the information out to them. So thank you, Teresa. <laughs> I want to add also the yes. whole reason we're doing a webinar is thanks to Teresa. I probably wouldn't have even thought that big, so thank you. Yes, and I think things, other than the few minutes at the beginning when we were working out some of the details, I think everything went well, it seemed like, for the host sites. Excellent. And to all of our host sites, if you can still hear me, thank you for participating and for our online participants. I think we had 25-ish total uh, joining us through the webinar between individuals and host sites. And of course, there were several at the host sites in addition to that. Um, Others, Illinois PTAC, of course we have Allison Hessler who's here, uh, who um, oversees our PTAC right here in this building and is fairly new to our staff and we're, we're so happy to have her and also happy to have the PTAC here at Southern Illinois University Carbondale. That's a new uh, thing. So all of those registrations, all of those things, uh, do you want to say something briefly about that, Allison, about how you might be able to help? Well, what Roland talked about with the SAM registration and DUNS and how Dan done is getting ready to move over to a different system, um, all of those things are um, what PTAC can help with um, in that initial phase. So Allison can add on whatever you want. <laughs> sure, whenever it comes to SAM registration, obtaining whatever identifying number that they're going to assign, which I've heard is going to be through Ernest & Young, please reach out to your local resources, whether it be your small business development center, your procurement technical assistance center, we are your direct source for getting you where you need to be. So please reach out to me. And I have cards, but um, you can also find me if you have the SBDC contact information, you can find me through SBDC here in Carbondale. Very good. And those services are open. Uh, small business development center, PTAC, I mean, we serve faculty, staff, students, people throughout the region. So um, throughout the state, uh, there are centers all throughout. So uh, let us know how we can help you. Um, also, Daryl Thomas, thank you for joining us today. Daryl is the program manager for the Illinois PTAC, and we appreciate you uh, joining us today as well. And then finally, our folks uh, from OSPA here on campus, again, if you uh, have questions for them or just need some contact information for them if you're here on campus. Um, hopefully this was helpful for you, but also um, for our attendees to be able to make some direct connections if you haven't already. Anything you would like to add? Um, no, just that um, kind of go off of the timeline as we So the timelines that Roland mentioned, backing those up even further if you're affiliated with the university because there are internal uh, processes. There's a number of officers that will have to do Okay, very good. Um, and then obviously, Roland, thank you so much. What a great job. I learned a lot. I hope all of you did. I'll be going back through slides and, and everything. 